check, check. Just give me a little check here, check, check. Let's just mic check, check. Well, check, check, check. Perfect. Let me hear you one more time. Test one, two, one, two, one, two. Test, test, test. Perfect. All right, all right, all right, lead heads. We are back with another episode of the Talking Lead Podcast. I'm your host, Lefty. We are in our 10th year of Leducating the Uneducated here at the Talking Lead Podcast. <laughs> you liked that, didn't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Trademark registered by Talking Lead. Um, so, yeah, we're here. We're back. Um, I took a little break. You guys know uh, a couple of weeks off there. You were probably longing for our episodes, but if you tuned into our social media, you were catching our live feeds and uh, all the cool stuff that we were doing from Sturgis during the Gun Fest, the first annual Gun Fest there at the Buffalo Chip in Sturgis, South Dakota during Bike Week of all weeks. <laughs> and uh, it was a good time. So if you're listening to this episode, it will be the episode prior to this where we talk about our travels to South Dakota uh, and all the fun and follies that we experienced during our trip. Uh, it was a good time with the crew from Caltech and American Zealot Productions. So go check that episode out. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it quite a bit. This episode, we're switching gears. We're going from motorcycles to submarines. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we do here. We shake it up on this podcast. You know, we talk about anything and everything because we want to show the diversity of the firearms community that it's not just the good old Bubba network that the liberal media makes us out to be, but that everyone, all walks of life, liberal, conservatives, all colors, all religions enjoy their their firearms and their, their Second Amendment rights here in the United States of America. And um, we do that by having diverse guests on the show and diverse companies and diverse products. And um, this guest that we have on this episode uh, is a former Navy nuclear submarine officer. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Uh, he is a best-selling author uh, in the, the realm of leadership and motivation, and he has a podcast and uh, his books. He's got three books that I know of uh, that are out. We're going to talk about his books. We're going to talk about submarines. And oh, by the way, he's also an avid bird hunter and a advocate for uh, our Second Amendment rights. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome in John Rennie to the podcast. And did hey, I say Rick. your last name right? Yeah, Rennie. Rennie. Like Rennie. A penny. Yeah, yeah. Rennie That's like good. a penny. <laughs> yeah, easy. <laughs> I like that. I like that. John, welcome in. We're uh, we're very grateful to have you join us. And uh, especially on such short notice, we kind of set this up um, real quick last minute. Um, like I said, I've been out of town and I'm, I'm doubling it up to catch up. So thank you so much for taking the time to, to join the Leadhead Brigade. Yeah, it's great to be here. Absolutely. Where are you uh, joining us from? I'm in uh, Wake Forest, North Carolina, which is just outside of Raleigh. Oh, beautiful North Carolina. That's a gorgeous area up there. It's very is that nice. where you grew up? No, no, I'm from New England originally. I grew up in New Hampshire, uh, went to school in Massachusetts, and then I was in the military. So I moved around quite a bit. And then um, then I spent 22 years in corporate America doing the same thing, moving around quite a bit. So, uh, and uh, yeah, now we've been in North Carolina quite some time now. We've kind of found a, a happy medium between too hot and too cold, I think, so. Yeah, so, so you went from government work to corporate work to to your own individual private uh, in ownership of your own company. And yeah, that's kind of the, the, the steps that I followed. Also, I, I worked, I didn't do military or anything like that, but I was, I worked for the government. I did some government work uh, for several years. Then I decided I want to get into the corporate side of things. And I did corporate America for several years. And then, you know, after seeing all the, the dubiousness and, you know, all the, uh, I guess, incompetence <laughs> that I was experiencing with the people that were above me, uh, I decided, you know what, I could do a whole lot better on my own. And yep. uh, I branched out and and did the kind of the same. So different, different uh, industries that we that we were in, but we kind of walk in the same path of life. 
Yep. So uh, uh, we want to hear your story uh, about how you how you got started with uh, with your career in the military, moving on to the corporate, and then moving on into the private uh, sector there. Uh, but first, John, I kind of prepared you for this oh, beforehand. Geez. <laughs> it's time for the Talking Lead Trains and Planes segment, where we uh, take care of some jack wagons and we honor some heroes. So, Gunny, bring that train in. Who Rob Semper Pi, do or die, hold them high at 8th and I. It is time for the Talking Lead Jack Wagon of the Week, so brace yourself, baby. So, the Gunny has brought the train in. And uh, we we got some some jack wagons that we want to take care of. And uh, as I like to do, I like to start with our guests. So, John, if you if you've got a jack wagon in mind that you would like to call out, uh, now's the time to do it. <laughs> or if well, you want me uh, to warm you up, I'd be happy to do that too. Uh, no, I was just thinking about um, uh, I don't know around Christmas time there was a CEO who fired 900 of his employees uh, right before Christmas uh, via a Zoom call. I uh, oh wrote gosh. about it on my uh, podcast. Forget the guy's name; it doesn't matter what his name is. But uh, if you're going to fire 900 people before Christmas, you probably uh, are a jack wagon. I would imagine. No yeah. doubt about it. That reminds me of. Did you ever watch Christmas Vacation? The movie. Christmas oh yeah, Vacation. that's the best. Yeah, it's the best. You know, so. Uh, not is it Christmas vacation or was it? Yeah, it was Christmas vacation where his boss. Yep. They cut out the Christmas bonuses. <laughs> you got the jelly of the month club. The jelly of the month club. Yeah. So even worse, he fired people. So yeah, that guy is definitely deserving of the talking that jack wagon train. No yeah. doubt about it. Yeah, especially so, with no no warning. Uh, you know, and just yeah yeah. That guy's got a special place in hell reserved for him. Yeah, I think so. No doubt about it. So my jack wagon and you, it kind of the jack wagon and the lead head brigade, brigade hero rolled into one, uh, kind of a one shot deal. So I'm sure a lot of you, you listeners are familiar with the, um, I guess the hearings or whatever they want to call where they've been putting several firearms manufacturers feet to the fire and, you know, having them come and testify in front of Congress. I think Daniel Defense is one, Ruger might be one, and then Smith and Wesson. Uh, are you familiar with that, John? Just a little bit, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's stemming from the recent um, uh, mass shootings that that have happened during the Biden administration, I might add. Um, so Smith and Wesson put out a public statement. The CEO of Smith and Wesson put out a, a public statement here, and I want to read this and and the jack wagons are the are the the comp, are the people and the organizations that are trying to um, ruin our constitution, ruin our Second Amendments, you know, our constitutional rights, especially our Second Amendment, um, by all their dubious means that they're you know that they're doing here. And and it's all political, you know, it's very transparent what they're trying to do. Um, so let me read this statement from Smith and Wesson CEO. It says, amid an unprecedented and unjustified attack on the firearms industry, Smith & Wesson Brands Incorporated President CEO Mark Smith responded Monday, and this would have been, uh, I don't have an actual date on it. Today is the 24th, which is a Wednesday. So I don't know if it was this Monday or last Monday. But anyway, it says a number of politicians and their lobbying partners in the media have recently sought to disparage Smith & Wesson some have had the audacity to suggest that after they have vilified, undermined, and defunded law enforcement for years, supported prosecutors who refused to hold criminals accountable for their actions, overseeing the decay of our country's mental health infrastructure, and generally promoted a culture of lawlessness, which that is exactly what they have been doing. And you see me looking around, I'm looking for my glasses. <laughs> I'm going to leave my glasses for this. Uh, Smith & Wesson and other fire manufacturers are somehow responsible for the crime wave that has predictably resulted from these destructive policies, but they are the ones to blame for the surge in violence and lawlessness, and they seek to avoid any responsibility for the crisis of violence they have created by attempting to shift the blame to Smith & Wesson, other firearms manufacturers, and law-abiding gun owners. 
which we see it daily, constantly, them pointing the fingers at, at us, law-abiding, responsible firearm owners. It is no surprise that the cities suffering most from violent crime are the very same cities that have promoted irresponsible, soft on crime policies that often treat criminals as victims and victims as criminals. Many of these same cities also maintain the strictest gun laws in the nation, but rather than confront the failure of their policies, certain politicians have sought more laws restricting the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens while simultaneously continuing to undermine our institutions of law and order and to suppress the truth some that some now seek to prohibit fire manufacturers and supporters of the second amendment from advertising products in a manner designed to remind law-abiding citizens that they have a constitutional right to bear arms in defense of themselves and their families and we've talked about this on the show many times about how we are being shadow banned the firearms industry anything firearms related uh, on these social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, I'm sure Twitter, I don't do much Twitter, but um, definitely uh, YouTube as well. So that's just kind of an example. And then he goes on to say, to be clear, a Smith & Wesson firearm has never broken into a home. A Smith & Wesson firearm has never assaulted a woman out of, for a late night run in the city. A Smith & Wesson firearm has never carjacked an unsuspecting driver stopped at a traffic light. So what he means by that is a firearm is an inanimate object. It, it's not alive. It cannot do these things on its own. It has to be willed to do that by a human, by a person. So that's what he, he means by that. So he goes on to say, instead, Smith & Wesson provides these citizens with the means to protect themselves and their families. We are proud of our 170 year history. We are proud of the commitment of our employees to making a quality product. We are proud to provide law abiding citizens and law enforcement, our customers, with the tools to provide their security and independence. We are proud of our responsible business practices. We will continue to work alongside law enforcement, community leaders, and lawmakers who are genuinely interested in creating safe neighborhoods. We will engage those who genuinely seek productive discussions, not a means of scoring political points. We will continue informing law abiding citizens that they have a constitutionality protected right to defend themselves and their families. We will never back down in our defense of the Second Amendment. Smith and Wesson empowering Americans. And that was a direct quote from uh, Mark Smith, the CEO, president of Smith and Wesson. And I, I mean, that sums it up perfect. And I don't know why more manufacturers haven't come out in this manner to fight against, to speak up against all the lobbying, all the, the gun grabbing that's going on and has been going on, um, but if we get more pushback like this from our industry, then you know that's the only way that we can we can make change and and keep our Second Amendment rights. So he is my hero for this episode of the Talking Lead uh, Planes and Trains. So welcome mm -hmm. to Lead Force One. That's <laughs> that's what our Leadhead Brigade heroes get a ride on. Uh, is this nice big cushy. Uh, 747 jumbo tricked out jet <laughs> french corinthian leather seats it's got a nice bar you know top top of the line mills so that's my hero have you got any heroes uh you know i had a, i had him on our podcast a guy by the name of ken blanchard who who's written like i've heard of ken blanchard yeah he's written like 65 books on leadership and and he's, you know, getting old now. He's in his seventies now, and uh, but he's still writing books. He's still trying to, to, uh, I don't know, just tell, teach people how to be great leaders. And uh, I look up to someone who's been in the industry a long time, and uh, he's been he's been preaching a good message for a long time. He's still doing it, still writing books, and uh, and he's someone that uh, 
I've read his books when I was a young manager and, and now as a, as an older manager, <laughs> older leader, I'm still reading his books. So he's, he's, he's one of the, my, one of my heroes. Very good. And you had him on your podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about, let's talk about your podcast. What is the name of your podcast? Oh, uh, my podcast is called deep leadership and uh, we it's, it's uh, I have guests on all the time and, and I have CEOs, military leaders, entrepreneurs, uh, authors, researchers, uh, and it's all based on the subject of leadership. So what, yeah. what are some of the best practices? What are some of the theories? What, uh, who's doing it right? Who's doing it wrong? How, do, how does leadership change now? You know, pre-COVID, mid-COVID, post-COVID. Uh, we, we went through all that uh, over the past two and a half years. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah, so it's all just bringing on uh, really experts and, and picking their brains and, and uh, you know, trying to find the best, you know, the best ideas to be able to lead people better. And that's what it's all about. So, you know, it, the purpose of the podcast is to build a world with better bosses. That's essentially what we do. And uh, nice. it's all about leadership. Yep. Very good. And that's called Deep Leadership. Yep. And I'm, I'm assuming that's on any podcasting app or listeners yeah, it's can on, go. It's and... on it all. Yeah, there isn't. I think we're on every one of them now, so. Okay. And then your website, I know there's links uh, from your website. If you let Ed's want to go to uh, John Rennie, it's J-O-N-R-E-N-N-I-E.com. Uh, yes, John, John S. Rennie.com. My middle initial in there, too. Oh, I missed the S. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. John, J-O-N-S-R-E-N-N-I-E.com. And uh, it's you got links glasses to glasses on too. You, I can't, I can't, I, can't I, there's it. no excuse for that. one. <laughs> I was just being lazy, man. I was being lazy, but uh, there's links to his books, his podcast. He does, uh, he's got a blog and then uh, there's uh, links to, and you've been on it, tons and tons of other podcasts. Uh, I was just going through the list there and yeah, mostly like, leadership and yeah. Mostly leadership and business podcasts. I think it's the first time I've been on a on a, a, a gun podcast. And I think when I when we were emailing back and forth, I thought it was lead talking lead <laughs> talking lead. I I talk about lead, you talk about lead. So <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we do uh, get into exactly what you are are talking about because the whole thing on the show is you know we like to keep it positive. Uh, by having people on that encourage you and make you a better person. And being a better leader is going to make you a better person in general. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So. You know, think about it. We're, we're leading all the time, whether it's uh, in our family as a father or a husband or a, or a wife or uh, and, 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 and in community organizations, you know, uh, you, you might teach Sunday school, you might, uh, you know, lead a Boy Scout troop, what have you. But you're, we, we're all, you know, Little League or soccer, we're all leaders uh, in our everyday walk in life. And so how do we be more effective? And, and what I like to talk about, and most of my books are based on the idea that leadership is a people business. So it's about people, it's about relationships, it's about building relationships, building trust. And uh, yeah, it's kind of old fashioned, but it's kind of missing because I think we, we, we're hurting in leadership these days. I mean, you know, you, you probably talk a lot about the politics of the day, but it's easy to look at our politicians and see a lack of leadership. Uh, for example, when you, see, when you see mandates I always say that's a failure in leadership to lead, right? And when you inspire people to do something, that's one thing. But when you, when you, when you recognize they don't do it and you have to mandate things and you have to make, create enemies uh, so that, uh, you know, and you, you, uh, you know, you, you lower the, the value of the people that, uh, uh, you know, are not following your, your, uh, your mandates, uh, then you're not leading, you know, you're basically a dictator at that point. And uh, so, yeah, we've seen a lot in po uh, politics for a long time. To be honest, it's been, it's been yeah. it seems to be getting worse. To be honest, so it does, it does, and it seems you know, in my 51 years on this this planet, and you know, going through the different uh, political climates, it it's definitely shifted and it's changing. And in my opinion, it does seem to be getting worse in instead of better. And, you know, I don't know if that's with the advent of social media, you know, or or what it is, but um, there's definitely been a, a drastic change in uh, not only our country's leadership, but, you know, even with some of the in yourself being in the, the corporate uh, world nowadays, you know, seeing how some of these companies uh, are being run. So definitely um, uh, noticeable from from my my standpoint. 
Yeah, you know, like we were talking about our our uh, jack wagons. Uh, you know, the, the guy I mentioned was his name is uh, I, I forgot what his name was when, I, when you asked me what his his name was Vishal Garg, and he led a company, a mortgage company called Better dot com. He's his personal net worth is four billion dollars, four billion with a B, and he's the one that laid off nine hundred employees uh, uh, right before Christmas. And uh, that's the kind of leadership we have in corporate America. And I'm trying to make, I'm trying to change that. You know, I'm trying to bring up the next generation leaders to have some value, some integrity, some, uh, some faith in people uh, and, uh, you know, not create the next, um, you know, egocentric uh, micromanagers, a lot of what we have in corporate today. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about your, uh, you know, your, your travels to becoming the uh, the leader that you are today uh and let's let's take it way back john let's take it back to your yeah. childhood <laughs> so uh you grew up on the east coast is that right yeah i grew up in a, a small town well it's it's the the largest city north of boston it's manchester new hampshire but it's only hundred thousand people there so fairly small city mm -hmm. uh grew up there my all four of my grandparents were born in that city. My parents were born in that city. I was born in that city. It was, the, it was, it's a blue collar city where most people, you know, you're born there, you live there, you die there. So not a lot of people right. uh, launch themselves from Manchester, New Hampshire into anything much, but much, but, um, but I had uh, the fortune of having uh, two grandfathers who served in World War II, one in the army and one in the Navy. And I think listening, you know, as a, as a child, listening to their stories, you know, in my mind of adventure, you know, kind of leaving the, the, the confines of, of, of my little city and going and do these amazing things around the world. Um, I said to myself, well, that's, you know, what I want to do, right? I want to do, I want to, I want to do something amazing. I don't want to just, you know, live in this town. And so um, I got fascinated early on with the idea of submarines. Uh, my, my grandfather uh, on one side who was in the Navy was involved in some pretty historic battles in the North Atlantic against German U-boats. And mm. fortunately, his uh, destroyer escort uh, came out on top. But I remember hearing those stories and thinking to myself, the idea of an underwater warship and the idea of being stealth, be able to sneak up on shipping. And and uh, so I, as a as a as a child, as a you know teenager, I was fascinated with the World War II stories. And, and what uh, era uh, yeah. did you grow up in? So I'm 55. So, you know, okay. I'm growing up pre pre Reagan. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm 51. In, so we're about the same. Yeah. Same so era. so when I, as a freshman in, in high school, that's when Reagan took over and, you know, started calling the, uh, the Soviet Union, the evil empire, started saying we're going to we're going to win the war, the Cold War. Uh, and then he said something that that really sparked my, you know, a child's imagination. He said, and submarines will play a key part in that victory. And I was like, all right, sign me up. Where do we go? I, I, and as a high school freshman, that's all I wanted to do. Really? I, from that point on, I wanted to serve on the boats. I wanted so, to be an officer. Even and, after watching Top Gun, <laughs> I mean, you still went the Navy route, but you didn't want to be a, an aviator. You wanted to be a submariner. Huh? So I spent uh, you know, my uh, my freshman year in college, uh, between my freshman and sophomore, no, it was my freshman year in college. I was in the Navy through ROTC, and I actually went down to Pensacola and did some pilot training for a week. And at the end of that, I was like, no, 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 that's not for me. So, you know, I'd rather be under the ocean than in the air somewhere, you know, at least under the ocean, you can get, you can get to the surface pretty easily. Uh, if you run, <laughs> you run out of propulsion, you're, you're going down fast. So you Right, you're going to hit hard. Yeah. So I didn't fall into the, uh, the, the, the Top Gun trap. Uh, although I had the same uniform as those guys, so I you did. Know, I, oh, you did. A lot of people did, but I had the same cool uniform, the choker whites and all that. So that, oh, that yeah. could help with the ladies. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> nice, very nice. So right out of high school, you joined the Navy. Yeah. So um, you know, it, it, to get to become an officer, you have to, um, especially on a submarine, you have to have a technical degree. You have to go to college and have a technical degree. So that's the thing I learned in high school. I, mean, I talked to my guidance counselor. I remember went up to him and said, hey, I want to be a submarine officer. What do I do? And the guy was like, I don't know. You're the first person who ever said that to me. <laughs> but to his credit, he did the research and said, well, you got to have a good technical, uh, you got to study math and science, obviously. And then you have to have, you have to go to college, get a good technical degree. Uh, if you want to get to the fleet, um, because you have to qualify as a nuclear engineer, which 
which is what I did. So I, I, uh, I did pretty good in high school, got into a pretty good uh, engineering school. I went to Worcester Polytech in, in Worcester, Mass. And I studied engineering, something, uh, and, and again, I should point out that my family is blue collar, like no one went to college and, uh, you know, and no one, certainly no one became an engineer and certainly no one was a submarine officer. So sure. I was doing stuff that was way outside of what, you know, traditional my family did. So, uh, but uh, yeah, so I went through, our, I got an ROTC scholarship four years, I uh, did four years engineering school, then I got my commission and went to the fleet at that point. Okay. Yeah. And and how many years did you spend in the, the Navy? I was in for five years active duty right out of college. Right out of college. Very yeah. nice. And, and what did you do on the nuclear submarine? What was your specialty? So I was what they call a line officer. And line officer is someone that's being trained to a one day take over command. So you end up having multiple different jobs. So for the time I was on board for five years, I had three different jobs. So my first job, I was the reactor controls officer. So I was responsible for all the men that uh, maintained and operated all the equipment around the reactor, all the, all the electronic equipment. And then mm -hmm. my next role, I was the machinery division officer. So I had, all, I had the entire engine room was my responsibility. And then uh, I became the missile officer. So I had the 24, uh, I can say it now, nuclear missiles we were carrying were under my responsibility. Oh, wow. That's yeah. a huge responsibility. It is, especially when you're like 23 years old. 23-year-old <laughs> in charge of 24 <laughs> nuclear bombs. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah. Yeah, it's wild. So, so how many different submarines did you serve on? I was just on one. I was on the USS Tennessee the whole time. She was a brand yes. new Ohio class. Yeah, submarine. USS yeah, Tennessee. Uh, you like Tennessee? <laughs> that's where that's where I'm at, baby. <laughs> All right. All right. Go Vols. Yeah. So we we actually have uh, orange in our in our you know our patch our uh, USS Tennessee patch is it's got a salute to the the volunteers in our uh, patch. That's but, uh, cool. Yeah, yeah. So um, I got to get. Yeah, she was she was a brand new Ohio class submarine, first Ohio class submarine for the East Coast. Um, she was brand new when I got to her, so she made a lot of deployments, and she's still operating today, which is amazing. And I'm calling her her because AP just boat. came out to say that uh, you can't call ships hers anymore. So, and I say, screw that. Um, <laughs> that's that's the way <laughs> it's always, always been. been hers. <laughs> so. Boats have always been hers, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, she's a great. Uh, she's a great boat. Um, Naval like vessels, I'll say. Yeah, exactly. So a great boat, and um, yeah, it was just a just awesome time. Really enjoyed. I did seven seven patrols, seven um, seven yeah seven patrols during the end of the Cold War. I got to see the Cold War come to an end while I was uh, while I was on board. So it was kind of neat to be a part of that part of history, essentially. So let's talk about, you say Ohio class, um, there yeah. are different classes of submarines. So kind of educate us on, on that aspect of a submarine. Well, in, in the U.S. Navy, there's three types of submarines. They're the fast attack submarines. These are typically the smallest and, and, and the fastest of, of boats. They typically don't carry uh, nuclear weapons, uh, but they are meant for, uh, to protect fleets and to go after uh, enemy shipping. So these are called fast attack. We have an SSGN, which are guided missile uh, um, uh, submarines, and these are, they're actually, uh, they're ballistic missile submarines that have been converted into, uh, into missile submarines where they're launching conventional missiles, uh, and they also deploy Navy SEALs. So the SSGN is a platform that deploys Navy SEALs, and it shoots a lot of uh, missiles like Tomahawk missiles at, you know, typically land targets. And then uh, the final type, the type I was on, was a ballistic missile submarine, which is carrying the large uh, nuclear weapons that are a big part of, you know, our our strategic deterrence during the Cold War, and then during um, and now, of course, I don't know what we call now. It's not the Cold War. I don't War know what now is. I mean, we'll <laughs> but, know ten years from now. They'll have a name for it, I'm sure. Yeah, so you know the Russians uh, were our enemies, then they became our friends, and now they're our enemies again. I guess I don't know. I can't keep track of it. It seemed to be everybody's enemy, but uh, China's. Right. Exactly. Know. Exactly. So, does, does this a yeah. picture of the USS Tennessee right here? Well, absolutely. That's it. Yeah, I spent a lot of time on that bridge. So yeah. And this is the bridge up here. Yeah, yeah. That's the that's the bridge, and those okay. are the various periscopes and radars and things like that. 
So I don't see any radar deployed, but. Yeah, so I was trying to find a really good picture of it, but um, you don't really see many pictures of a sub underwater. I haven't been able to find those either. Submerged. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's usually dark under there. That's why. Um, yeah, but, you know, with today's technology, you think they have something. Come on. <laughs> I had an opportunity to have uh, the Go former ahead. head of SEAL Team 2 on my podcast, and he said, yeah, he goes, I love submarines. I said, the most, he says, the most amazing thing was, was, uh, was parachuting down on, on, on a submerged one in, in, the, um, in the Caribbean. You could see it all the way under the water. The, the water was so clear. Oh, and wow. I'm thinking, I thought I was cool. That guy's like super cool. <laughs> you know, so, diving, you know, jumping out of a plane towards a submerged, a submerged submarine. Yeah, That's I've had cool. several uh, Navy SEALs on this show. Um and one particularly that's in that's in your realm of expertise, the leadership um, industry. Uh, Jay Redman, are you familiar with Jason yeah. Redman? Yeah, I, did. Okay. I am. Yeah, yeah, so he's been on. I've had him on a couple of times, and uh, I mean, his uh, his speeches and his motivation are very infectious. Uh, really good um, speaker. Really, really liked having him on. Um, yeah. Commander uh, Coulter. Uh, who I've been working with um, on some projects that I can't talk about yet, but we're going to talk about them on upcoming projects. And uh, he's been on the show a couple of times, so you lead heads uh, that are familiar with uh, Commander Coulter um, know probably what I'm talking about. But, uh, yeah, so what was the guy that you had? What was his name? I may know him. Uh, you not, got I, I'll edit. Up. I'll edit. We'll look him up. <laughs> I'll look yeah, at uh, uh, just uh, Jack Riggins. Uh, sorry, yeah, Jack Riggins. R I G G I N S. Yeah, yeah. There it Jack, is. It is. Jack Riggins. So Jack Riggins, and he was on your podcast, so people can oh, yeah, go and, yeah. and check out that episode with Jack. I've not had Jack on. I'm not familiar with with Jack. Oh, Yato, he's good, good guy, real good. Guy. I would love to. I would love yeah. to. Um, I, like yeah. I said, I've had several. I mean, I, in ten years of doing this podcast, I can't remember everybody I've had on, but. That's my problem right now. I've had, uh, yeah, I'm starting to forget people that have been on the show. So it's fun to, <laughs> it's actually fun to listen to old episodes. You're like, oh, that was such a great conversation. But there's been it was like, so I many. forgot that, you know. Yeah, um, exactly. Kind exactly. of deal. Um, but um, the White Settle, uh, who is one of the the owners of Seal One, is a CLP uh, product, another former Navy Seal, and they're one of our sponsors uh, okay. as well. But I love hearing their their stories. We had. Well, he goes by Jack Carr, you know, Jack Carr, the, the author, we've had him on and just listening to their stories, man, it's just to, to just fantasize through them and, and hear the stories that they've had and, you know, what, compare it to some of these movies that you see. Um, it's just, it's amazing. So you said you had the opportunity to work with some, some SEALs on your submarines in what capacity um, yeah, I, did you I interact did not. with them? We, we were we were uh, ballistic missile submarines, so we did not carry the seals on our on our platform. Mm. So, but but a lot of the former Ohio class boats that were set up for ballistic, they were converted to uh, to guided missile uh, boats, and they carry they carry that. If you'll see, if you ever see a picture of a Ohio class submarine that looks like it's got a looks like got a tin can on the top of it, so that's actually the seal delivery uh, vehicle. So that's what they use to. Uh, the seals will deploy out of so uh, we didn't have that uh, that function we didn't operate with seals on our on our platform so you didn't so. shoot them through the torpedo launchers <laughs> no no we no sadly that would have been fun but no we did not yeah. so we were we carried uh conventional torpedoes and then nuclear missiles so we were, I got you. we were the uh hi, our mission was to hide with pride and hide uh, with be, pride and be stay, there if they need to stay undetected us. Yeah, yeah. We we talked, you know, before, yesterday we were talking, you know, concealed carry. We're we're kind of that concealed carry. We're that weapon just in case. Hey, that's a great way to put it. I was looking for one of those um, that might be like the ones you're talking about, but I yeah, I look up uh, if you look up SSGN, um, uh, and I'm trying to think. Of, like I think the Florida is an SSGN uh, now. It's been converted. But if you look up an SSG, we didn't have the SSGNs when I was in. So this is a recent thing. You know, as the Cold War ended, we were like, well, we've got these amazing platforms. What are we going to do with them? Uh, and then they created these SSGNs. I think the USS Florida is an example of them. There's USS Ohio is one of them. There you go. You see that. You oh, see this that. thing here? 
Yeah, that's where they'll launch ah. the, uh, the seals out of. So yeah, the same okay. exact platform I was on, but it's been modified to sure. carry conventional missiles and uh, to deliver seals. And I believe the USS Ohio actually has two of those on its backside. So, um, which I think is unique. So, uh, but I don't know much about. I, I've interviewed some SSGN uh, officers uh, on my podcast, but I have not. I wish I wish they were around during my time. I definitely would have. Uh, been on wanted I would want to be on that platform because it's pretty unique so they can go in in a conventional war and they can they can launch a lot of Tomahawk missiles deploy Navy SEALs and so it's the kind of the kind of uh, warfare that we're into these days it's much it's it's been converted into a much more usable platform than the than the ballistic missile boats gotcha so um, you said you served five years so what year was it that you did you retire? I would. Is that how we? No, would... I just got out in 1994. Okay. I, 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 you know, my five year. Did commitment your five year deal? Yeah, and part of the reason was um, I absolutely love what I did, but um, nobody senior of me, like all the senior officers and senior enlisted, were, had all been divorced at least once. So <laughs> this was not a business for having a family and yeah. uh, and being um, having a normal life. So you, we spent a lot of time out at sea. And back then we were completely isolated. So there was no communication whatsoever. So no email, no phone calls. You were just gone for three months and then you came back. So uh, it was a different lifestyle and it was um, not good for marriages and families. So I, I got out, went into the Absolutely. corporate world like a lot of people do, um, you know, so, but I, I really enjoyed my time and it was kind of fun to be there, you know, to see, to really to see the Soviets disappear from the Atlantic Ocean. They went from having a ton of submarines and ships all over the Atlantic to having virtually none by the time I got out. And why why was that? Because they just decommissioned them or were they getting Yeah, they ran out of money. Sinking. <laughs> they were just <laughs> sinking. <laughs> they couldn't they couldn't pay their sailors, they couldn't feed their sailors, they couldn't keep their boats maintained and and so they disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the longest uh, deployment underwater that you 110 days. 110 days. Yeah. And how many people were on your submarine? We had 155 uh, in the crew. So it was like 15 officers and then the rest, you know, and the rest uh, enlisted sailors. Is that, is that one of the largest submarines? It is. Yeah. The, the, the Ohio class is the largest U.S. submarine. You know, it doesn't, I mean, the Soviets had bigger boats, but um, this was, this is the biggest U.S. boat. Yeah. So being underwater for that long, that amount of time, uh, what kind of effects does that have? You know, you, you hear about the astronauts and being out yeah. in the, you know, the, the weightlessness and, you know, all that, that it, it does things to the bones and to the, the muscles. And are there any adverse effects? Yeah, I mean, if one of the things that's weird is you don't have any um, distance vision. You lose your, your uh, farsightedness because you never use it because uh, you're when you're underwater for that long um, so it takes you a while to get that back again the other thing is um when you <laughs> when you first get into a car after being on a submarine that long is everything seems so much faster you're just like oh slow down. <laughs> you know because your body down. your body <laughs> has not gone that fast uh because it's 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 a slow moving vessel basically it's not a very speedy vessel but um so you're things seem to be faster. Um, the other thing is, but um, you have no, you have no reference points to, to the speed or anything. Cause I, I don't guess you have like windows and things no, that you can look no, out. There's no windows. You have no reference on speed. Um, no. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, so that's, that's a little bit, uh, it's, it takes a while to get used to. The other thing is you'll notice you'll be taking a shower on land and you'll notice you're still swaying to the, to the ocean, <laughs> but there's no ocean. You're like, why am I still swaying? So, takes you a while to um, get your land legs back after you've been out to sea that long. And, uh, yeah. but uh, the other thing too is, so inside a submarine, if you can imagine 155 dudes, right? So what do you think that smelt like on board, right? Oh my uh, gosh. Worse than our RV trip to uh, Sturgis, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> so yeah, you're talking burps and farts and, and yeah. everything, you know, under the stinky ocean. feet, hundred percent <laughs> smelly armpits, you name it, but you get to the point where you just get used to it. And so when you smell fresh air, it actually smells horrible. When they first open up the hatches, you're like, ah, this, this is terrible. What is that smell? <laughs> and so you get used to it. And uh, your clothes, 
your clothes will smell like that. The the uniforms we wore um, under under see these one piece uh, coveralls we wore. They they smell like that. That summer you can't get that smell out of them. It's even just, if you dry clean it, you can't get that out. You can't get it out. It's just uh, even today I, I've got some in the attic. They still smell like the boat. You just can't get that smell. Bring out back of it. memories, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, it does. It does. But it it stinks. And uh, but it's. You get used to it, and uh, it, you you don't even notice it, you know. And the other thing is too the, uh, you know, there's always air moving around on the submarine, so we have ventilation mm -hmm. fans running at 60 hertz all the time. That there's a hum, and you cannot get when it goes silent. Like when those fans go off, that's that's our biggest fear. And so sometimes at night, when you're back home, you can't hear that those fans, and you can't sleep. You're like, where's the, you know, where's that right. hum? You start panicking a little bit. It's a constant background uh, through the, your entire day and night and every, every day, every night for months on end. So, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, you get used to that, that frequency. You know? yeah. yeah. And I'm sure that does something with your brain waves and you know, the harmonics of your, your body. Definitely. Yeah, I don't know. But, um, yeah, it, it takes a while to get used to living on land again. And So uh, not having night and day references either. How how did how did that affect your sleep cycles and yeah so the, the it's interesting uh, back then we operate on on we had four shifts we had four six hour watches essentially so so that meant we had we had four meals a day we had breakfast lunch we had dinner and then we had mid rats which was the midnight ration so you ate at six noon six and midnight so you you ate every six hours and you stood watch every six hours. So most of the only time you knew, you, the only time you really knew if it was night or day was what they were serving. So if it was eggs, <laughs> you're like, this must be morning, uh, you know. And if it's burgers, you're like, okay, this must. So be they could have really messed with you and just just switched the menu on you, and you oh, still yeah, you, would, yeah. you wouldn't have known what <laughs> what time of day oh, it was. So, and so we actually operated on something called Tennessee time. This was my captain's idea. So we would operate twelve hours opposite of the local time. So if it was six in the morning we would be operating at six at night. So if it was, okay. so three in the afternoon, local time would be three in the morning. And the reason was, is that most of the, most of the sailors are up during the normal day period. So from six to about six at night, six in the morning, six at night. And that's when we ran our drills. And so the captain wanted to be, if we were running a drill, we had to go to the periscope depth. He wanted it to be at nighttime. So we would change our clocks 12 hours uh, to be opposite of whatever the local time was. So it would mess with you. So we would have, you could get jet lag with ever, without ever going anywhere because right. suddenly it was, you know, daytime and you're like, well, you know, you go from, you, you have lunch and then you have lunch again, you know, and like, yeah, oh. it would, it would just kind of mess with your brain a little bit, but yeah. And it, like a lot of times as an officer, I'd forget that it was dark outside, you know, cause you're thinking, well, it's, it's, it's eight in the morning. We're about to do a drill. I go up and it's dark. I'm like, oh, that's right. It's really Eight at night. It's really <laughs> at, at night. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, I guess you were all over the the globe in in the sub, or were you just kind of in the vicinity of American. Yeah, we so we operated in the full body of the Atlantic Ocean. So we um, and <clears throat> my first few patrols, we operated uh, closer to you know to Russia in the North Atlantic. Um, and uh, we we had a we had an advanced missile on board. It was a Trident two D five missile, and it had the longest range and accuracy of any ballistic missile submarine. So eventually, they realized we could hit all of our targets uh, just basically anywhere in the Atlantic Ocean. So mm -hmm. so it made sense to just hide us in random places. And uh, so pretty much, I've been in the entire Atlantic Ocean some at some point. So <laughs> so not never over in the Pacific. You're always in the Atlantic. I was an Atlantic okay. sailor. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Now you're talking about the missiles. Um, and you know, nowadays we're hearing more about the, those, the, is it hypersonic missiles? Yeah. Yeah. That are being uh, developed. Um, what, what's your take on those, the hypersonic missiles? Yeah. I don't know much about them other than it was supposedly, you know, we, they get on target so quick that we can't react. So it, it changes the whole balance of uh, deterrence, but I don't know much about it. I'm not yeah. that. I can't imagine we don't have that technology too. I just... So I'm, I'm, I don't know anything. I have no inside knowledge, but I guarantee you we got something. I mean, think it's about like, all the I don't know billions. <laughs> think about all the billions that are given to these uh, 
you know, these defense contractors. I guarantee Absolutely. we got something. So if we uh, don't have something, we got something in the works. So yeah, and definitely probably something that will stop them or deter them. I don't know. I'm, yeah, I'm not. I yeah. If I heard if I heard the Pentagon talking more about it, I'd be worried. But I don't. I don't. You don't hear them talking about it. So they, they must have something. So they only talk about stuff that they don't. Yeah. I mean, it's all misinformation. You know. Right, right, exactly. It's all a big misinformation campaign. And, right, right. You know, I'm not yeah, a with, conspiracy with, theorist at all. Yeah, but, <laughs> but makes yeah, you wonder, right? When you know, like in the middle of COVID, right? The the big the biggest news story that didn't exist was the fact that the government told us that UFOs existed, and everyone went. <laughs> They're like, we knew that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but but it makes you makes you think, like, if they're admitting that UFOs are exist maybe they don't exist and they're, it's it's a misdirection right so you right know, because all the years they've been denying it and trying to hide it and cover it up and right. not, now all of a sudden they're like oh yeah they're real they're they're admitting it you know yeah, kind of yeah. deal but so. what speaking of i mean in this i usually ask this later on uh, <laughs> but i'll go ahead and ask it now since we were talking about it uh, what's your take on ufos and specifically aliens ufos not you know, unidentified flying objects. Cause you know, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, it's, I'm, I'm one of those guys that, that hope they exist just cause I think it's cool. But I, I was, I was of the age and you're probably similar, like, you know, close encounters came out and, you know, like star like Wars. 70s, close encounters, yeah, 70s star Trek. Big on, yeah. Big on, on, uh, you know, alien shows. There was project blue book was a show that was on TV back then. And, and so, yeah, I, I'm one of the guys that, that hopes they're real uh, uh, but I, I have no idea. And, and you've uh, never had any encounters at sea because a lot of them are talking about underwater, you know, now yeah, they're talking yeah. about that's where the majority of them are, are they live in the ocean. Yeah. So interesting. I did a, ask me anything, anything on Reddit one time and that I got more questions on UFOs than anything else. And, uh, <laughs> I can tell you this. I was, I was under the ocean for five years and I did not see any UFOs. So for take it for what it's worth and, and and i'm not under any obligation to not tell you the truth but You're not any ndas or anything like that <laughs> no no i never saw anything so. and you, you probably got some of the most sophisticated um radar detection systems than than any other probably vehicle or branch of the military in your submarines i would assume yeah yeah but again <clears throat> we it would be hard I mean, you know, we we use uh, we use passive sonar to listen into the ocean. Um, so if these things are silent, we wouldn't hear we wouldn't hear them. So um, yeah, and like you I, said, you don't have windows on so you don't have you windows. Can't, you no. can't look out. So no, and 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 you gotta you gotta remember that everything in the military is geared towards you know the enemy we we're facing, not not a, a UFO. So we yeah. we wouldn't necessarily have the right gear for identifying and seeing do you have cameras on the the outside that you can so i think today that they they do operate a lot of remote cameras inside the uh, periscopes and things but we we did not and i'll tell you this kind of funny story i was actually the ship's photographer for a couple of patrols and we literally had a 35 millimeter camera we would strap <laughs> on we would strap on to the, the periscope to take pictures of enemy ships and that's what hilarious so, yeah yeah so, so. people don't oh, realize the technology that, yeah, I mean, 1994 was when I got out, and, and your computers were just really getting going, and, and the internet That's was true. still like chat rooms and things. So it, it's, it was really early yeah. when I was in. MySpace kind of stuff. <laughs> I think it was pre-MySpace. <laughs> Pre-MySpace, yeah. So, um, you know, that that also is an ass. I don't, I don't know why they wouldn't put cameras all around it, everywhere, not just for – research purposes is like a submarine being that depth you know going that much ocean i mean think of all the the i'm gonna say wildlife sea life that you could detect and find probably you know thousands yeah. of species we never even seen before yeah so we we um we hear them so we we have um we have hydrophones all over the submarine uh, that we can listen in. So, like, I, when yeah. I'd be on the mid watch, I, I'd have a couple speakers next to my operating area, and I would turn up the the hydrophones just to listen to the ocean sounds, and we hear all sorts of stuff. But um, it's so dark where we operate 
that a window really wouldn't be pretty pretty use useless. I know we would. You got all this tech. You got thermal. You've got you know infrared. Nah, you can't use any of that under underwater. I don't know. Maybe today. I don't know. But back then it was you know. But it was just dark. That's true. Back then, yeah. It's it's dark and uh, it's cold and it's uh, not much going on. You know. I mean, it, the ocean is really big. Well, how do you know? You didn't have windows. You couldn't see. <laughs> How do you know? Like, could you know, be. maybe the, would, the world's would, largest would, yeah, so whale down there or something. We, we would put up the periscope before we, we would we would go to periscope depth. And we you could look around the periscope. Um, and as you get closer to the surface, the light would start coming in. You could see things. Yeah. Occasionally you see fish swimming like right behind the periscope, just sort of, you know, you'd be staring at a fish's eyeballs. But uh, <laughs> yeah. You didn't. there wasn't much to see. It's a big ocean. It really is. It is. And that, that again, <laughs> I don't. And maybe they do it nowadays. Maybe they have the cameras and they're recording this stuff. And I mean, who knows? I don't. I don't. Somebody I don't, knows. I don't know. I'm out. You don't know. <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. He's like, I am out. <laughs> so, so what? What is the uh, weirdest encounter that you experienced? Um, and you said you the longest time that you were submerged was 120 days or 110. 110. Yeah. Is that yeah. completely without coming up to the surface at all, or? Yeah, no, we would come up to periscope depth, but um, the, the, so surfacing the boat was typically at, at, the, at the end of patrol, we would take the boat, we would actually come out of the water. But, it, you know, we, we, we would come out for, to pick up uh, riders, different people that we would be coming on the boat to evaluate us and what have you. So, no, that wasn't uh, completely. So there's no water. periodic breaks where you would come up during that 110 days to get people exposure to sunlight or anything no, like that come out no no most so it of was it completely is, in yeah, that i would say so. 90 90 days of completely under without come without surfacing so you wow. were just periscope depth would be the closest you come to the surface and yeah. what what do you do on a submarine for or you say six on you got four shifts of six is that what it's so it depends on how many people are qualified. what do you do when you're not working <laughs> <laughs> so you would run your department like I had, you know, I was in charge of different departments and uh, I'd run my department and then I would I would sleep and get ready for the next watch. And typically what you did is you'd have one watch, you stand watch, you would work. You, so you stand watch for six hours, you'd work for six hours and you would sleep for six hours and you go back on watch. So you would you're pretty much like an 18 hour day, essentially. But you would yeah. your sleeping window was in one of those watch sections. And, you know, most times they were running drills during your sleep time. So you never really got much sleep. So we were and always during, sleep deprived. Yeah. yeah. And during your time, again, you know, technology's not, wasn't the way it is nowadays. You know, I can imagine that on subs now they've got TVs and movies and video games and, you know, things like that to, to keep them occupied during, you know, the, the downtimes, uh, maybe exercise equipment. I'm, I'm sure you oh, guys yeah. probably had some sort of gym oh, yeah, or something a, like that. We had a gym. We had a gym in, uh, in missile compartment, lower level. We had uh, two treadmills. We had a couple of exercise bikes, a rowing machine, and then like a universal weight machine. Um, so we had that. And um, so we had movies. In fact, uh, we had actually first run movies they'd put on the boat for us. So they were all VHS back then, but we had a big, right. li yeah, we had a big library of VHS films and a lot of a lot of the guys would bring their own, you know, VHS tapes from home. Uh, I remember one guy was. From oh, I bet they did. <laughs> yeah, one, that's a whole other story. But uh, yeah. Then, yeah, one guy from Georgia that liked the Andy Griffiths show. So he every oh time my he was gosh. in the wardroom, every time he was in the wardroom, and I'm from the north. I never saw that show, and I I didn't uh, I didn't quite relate. But uh, yeah, we would get Andy Griffiths. Uh, How could you like, not? Relate? I mean, one of the greatest leaders of all time, Andy Griffiths. <laughs> Well, I got to, I, I I appreciate it now, but back then, you know, I thought, you know, what is this country bumpkin? I learned a <laughs> lot of life lessons from from watching Andy Griffith, uh, Barney Five, yeah, the Barney Lopey, Five. yeah, yeah, the Lopey, and um, uh, what was his uh, his aunt? Uh, B. Aunt B. B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. B. yeah. <laughs> So yeah, but we so you'd get all that kind of stuff, and you you mentioned the other thing of it was kind of funny is the, uh, you know, pornography was interesting. Um, <laughs> I didn't mention so that. <laughs> some people would bring those, and uh, like it is funny the the chiefs' quarters now chiefs are the senior enlisted um, uh, sailors on the boat, so they're they've come up through the ranks, and so they're still below officers, but they're they're above most of the sailors, and they had their own quarters. 
And so as an officer, you had to go in the chief's quarters a lot to talk to your chief because they're typically your second in command of your division. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, many times you go into the chief's quarters and there's, you know, porn stuff going on, on TV. <laughs> and you're like, just why, day why are you day. doing that? You should just forget about that for three months because it's <laughs> or six months. I mean, it's human and nature. Then, how, how do you right. forget about that? And I guess at the time when when you were saying there were no women allowed. Right, right. Is that still the policy? Nowadays? No, no. They have uh, women on board the uh, SSBNs and SSGNs now, the bigger the bigger submarines. OK, and that, yeah. that that's like a uh, mix men, women, or is it all women crew or? No, no, it's a mix. It's a mix. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What do they call that? Co-ed. Co-ed. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. I had one of the first female um, submarine officers on my on my uh, podcast. And it was interesting because I wanted to talk to her about what her experience was like compared to my experience. I bet. And I would say this is that she 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 had the same experience I did. It's still all the frustrations, the, the challenges. She had it just like I did. Um, but, but, but even then it's, it was like it, more, more difficult for her is that she was one of the first women on a submarine. So like the, every, everyone even like warned before she got here, how to act around women. So everyone was just afraid. So she said she would come down, a, she'd come, come down a hallway and everybody would just move out of her way and like, you know, right. stare straight ahead. And she's like, look, I'm, I'm human. You can look at me. You can talk to me. Right. You know, so yeah. well, she had, everyone was just afraid, you know? When they first... In that, yeah, in that environment, and you know, her kind of being a trailblazer. You know, yeah, yeah. It takes some but adjustment. She, but she was, you know, from all intents and purposes, she she was a very competent uh, officer, and I was I was you know glad glad to talk to her. Just it was good to know that the standards weren't lowered. That they, they, it's difficult to do that job, mm -hmm. and the women that are on board are doing that job, doing it well, from what I can tell. Yeah. yeah. And what was your rank? I was lieutenant when I got out. Lieutenant, yeah. Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> I was Lieutenant John. Yeah, Lieutenant John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I've got lots of other submarine questions that you know I could go on for hours asking you about about submarines. But so you five years on the submarine. Um, I mean, you got to be very disciplined in that environment, um, structured. Uh, I would assume that that's probably played a big role in you developing the leadership skills that you have today. Um, moving on from that, you, you said when you got out of the Navy, you went into corporate America and you've run, was it 20 different? Uh, yeah, eight different manufacturing eight. businesses. Yeah. Or eight. 20. <laughs> well, it was 20, 22 years. I ran eight different manufacturing businesses during that time. So, okay. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. So I got, I got my fill of um, corporate life, what it's like to work for three. I work for three different global companies. So uh, that meant a lot of global travel. It meant, um, you know, uh, you know, operating these big, big manufacturing plants, and uh, yeah. But it also meant. Uh, I would you know, assume you've got an engineering background. Is that what you? Your I have a study? yeah. I have a mechanical engineering degree. At my undergrad is in. So yeah. Gotcha. And yeah. talk about some of the the corporate companies that you ran during those twenty years. Maybe some of the more memorable ones. Yeah, I mean, my first plant was uh, we we were a manufacturing plant in um, in Florence, South Carolina, making circuit breakers that were you know fifteen thousand volt circuit breakers, very large circuit breakers, and uh, that was a lot of fun because it was the first time that I had my own manufacturing business. It was sort of like being captain of your own ship because we were remote, like there was no other corporate businesses around. So mm -hmm. I was like the like the uh, you know, the biggest guy in the company, you know, in, in that state, essentially. So, you know, there was no one around locally. So it was kind of fun to be remote and have your own business. But um, but there was a lot of challenges with that. So because I was so new, I was 32 years old when I got my first manufacturing plant. I didn't really know oh, much wow. about manufacturing. So, but, I, you know, that crew was, the crew that worked there was, they were just a great group of people. And they, um, they embraced this, you know, I was the youngest manager in that plant's history. So they, they, they embraced this young, you know, young looking and young uh, manager that came in and, and did his best. And uh, I think it was, it was there where I really learned the power of people, because I think when I first went into the role, I thought, well, I had to have all the answers. I was the boss. I've been promoted. Right. So I got to have mm -hmm. all the answers. I got to I got to dictate things from the corner office. You go here, you go there, you do this. But what I realized is that you know, it didn't take me too long to realize that all the knowledge for 
you know, running this business resided in the minds of the experienced employees. And so mm -hmm. I learned through that first role in corporate that if I tap into all this, you know, wisdom that we had in that building, we were going to be a much better operation. So, so I was, you know, for me, it was about breaking down the walls between hourly and salaried employees and, and building, you know, building a, a team and, and getting us focused on one goal. And uh, almost like a, a back in the submarine days, we bring everybody together and mm -hmm. uh, operating towards a single mission. And uh, I had, that was a lot of fun. And it was, it was a small operation, 140 people. So you could really, you know, you knew everybody's name, you knew about their lives. And, and so I really enjoyed being out on the shop floor, getting to know people. That was, that's my, you know, still even to this day is probably the funnest job I ever had in corporate was yeah. running a small plant like this. Was, was this in America, this, this plant? Cause you yeah, said you've been in, all over the world. Yeah, it's been, it was in Florence, South Carolina. So, okay. yeah. Well, to me, they spoke another language because I was from New England. I didn't quite understand what they were talking about. <laughs> well, you don't have a New England accent. You know, that's kind of. No, I, I do not. I do not. I've lost it over the years. Um, yeah. So I, I go uh, I go hunting in uh, New Hampshire every year and uh, I'm I can barely understand the people from my home state. Do you start uh, when you go back home? Do you start picking up that that, that dialect again? I don't think so. No, I don't. You ever noticed don't. it? No, my my father and brother and the guys I hunt with are, are very heavy New England accents, and I just have kept mine. And they they always say hey, you sound funny. I'm like I, I don't sound funny. I sound like the folk the folks on the national news. You sound funny. <laughs> <laughs> You're just stealth. That's what you've you've right. adapted and blended in. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't know yeah. what happened to it. Yeah. Yeah, but we we laugh about it because it's just the the accent's so heavy up there. That well, I noticed uh, when I was in corporate. Um, and when I worked, well, not so much when I worked for the government because I worked for the the state government here in Tennessee. So, but I noticed when I went corporate, I was losing my southern accent. Mm. Um, just because I think <clears throat> southern accents, people don't take you as serious or think you're as you know intelligent. You know, they they associate it with with hillbilly redneck, you know, kind of kind of ways and. Um, anywhere I would go, people go, you know, where are you from? You know, I'm from Tennessee. Like, you don't have an accent. I was like, mm, okay, maybe, maybe I don't. But when I got out of that and started doing my, it, it came back and you can probably yeah. hear it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know where, where accents go, but, um, I don't have as much. It's an, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think it's just a, a human adaptive process that we, we go through. We try to fit in, we try to blend in with our, you know, our surrounding environment. I think it's more of a survival type instinct. Um, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. And the other thing I would say this is that um, one of the things I noticed about myself just over the years is I I tend to be a little empathetic. Like I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm really good at sales, for example, because I, I really do like empathize with my customers and the challenges that they have. I empathize with my employees and the, the frustrations they have. So I think I think part of being a good leader is having that ability to sense what the emotions are of the, you know, the person across the table from you. And I think that's something that's been a little bit of a, you know, a superpower that I have is having the ability to, to, and I think probably as a result of that, I probably morph into my language probably morphs to fit the uh, situation like that. Yeah. Too, I, would, I would imagine. Yeah. But you can't really, you can't really be empathetic towards someone unless you've actually experienced it yourself. So you know, going through your years of experience, you know, that's things that you've experienced and, you know, you're, you're able to, you know, bring a, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, but a real, you know, come across as real and, you know, with your empathy. And I'm sure they sense that. It's like, oh, he, you know, he's been through this before. He understands exactly what I'm yeah, talking I think, about. Yeah, I think being, you know, growing up blue collar was a big part of that. So I, I related more to the people on the shop floor than I did the people in the office. Right. I, 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 I related well to, you know, the guy that was, you know, had the manufacturing job that, uh, you know, was trying to pay his bills and, and um, trying to take care of his family. And I just sort of I related more to that because that's where I grew up in. And I did not grow up in a place where um, there was a lot of money and there was a lot of, um, you know, and we were, fan, you know, resources. Fantastic. Yeah. And resource. I mean, like I, we didn't dress up. We, you know, it's 
it's like even today, right? As an entrepreneur, I wear t-shirts and jeans and boots and, and, and that's what I wear. That's my uniform. And, and I have a closet full of corporate clothing. I'd probably never wear again. And oh my gosh. Yeah. So, all yeah. my suits and everything are, yeah. 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 just got dust all over them, you know? So right. Right. My dress so, shoes. Oh my God. I haven't even looked at my dress shoes in years. So I don't <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. There's no telling what kind of condition they probably got mold on them by now. Uh, but I think I think that's uh, you know having you having had that experience and being coming up blue collar I think um, you know it's funny because a lot of my peers didn't understand how I could relate well to the folks on the shop floor uh, because a lot of them you know they they their whole lives were about getting into management and you know getting the degrees and getting the sort of climbing the ladder yeah yeah climbing the ladder I found myself sort of. Um, my wife would say uh, I, I was pulled kicking and screaming up the corporate ladder is what uh, she would say. So I ended up getting a lot of responsibility and multiple plans and all this sort of things, but it was never anything I was applying for. It just sort of kept getting more and more responsibility. So, yeah. And, you know, it, it seems, uh, I don't want to say, but so what I'm trying to say is that I noticed that a lot of former military people, um, tend to be higher up in, you know, the, I guess the more successful companies. Mm. Uh, there seem to have more military type uh, people that are leading and guiding those, um, those companies. Um, would you say that the military um, instills that? Because you, you hit on something a minute ago where you were talking about, you know, taking a small group of people and focus, focusing them on a single mission, you know, to get it accomplished. Um, yeah. Talk, talk yeah. about the military and how maybe that played a part in your development. Yeah, so, so the military leadership was a big, it, it was considered a skill and it was a, something that you trained and you learned and were taught. Uh, you couldn't be promoted until you, into a higher level of leadership until you served as a lower level of leadership. So you were, you grew as a leader from the from the ground up essentially. Uh, and leadership training was a big part of everything we did. Even even when I was in ROTC before I got my commission, we took leadership classes, and so leadership was taught. It was so one of the things I noticed in my corporate career is that we treat leadership as sort of like a an extra like. Like you're a really good, um, you're a really good uh, uh, engineer. So we're going to make you the engineering manager. So you're like, okay, well now I've got the title of manager, and I have no skill sets. I have no none of this. I've got great engineering skills. Right. I don't have any leadership. I don't skills. know what managing means. <laughs> yeah. So we we don't we we look at leadership skills as like, oh, you'll figure it out, right? But leadership is a whole nother. It's its own set of skills and you have to learn them. You have to practice them. And typically it's best done And the military did a really good job under a, uh, a mentor mentee relationship where you had a senior leader helping a junior leader develop his or her skills. Right. So that's why military leaders are so good when they get out because they actually learned leadership. It, it is something they learn. Yes. You know, like a seal was good at shooting and explosives and languages and all that, but he also learned leadership and we also learned leadership we were great at weapons i was great at nuclear power and all that stuff but i also learned leadership it was it was a whole skill set yeah. and we don't look at it like a skill set and that's where the biggest challenge is today how that's would why, you, yeah no i was gonna ask how would you define leadership what is leadership yeah it's motivating a group of people to get something done it's it's that simple it's it's and it's three things it's 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 motivating right so you have to you have to know your people and it's people so they get the job done and it's your goal what what are you trying to accomplish there's three things and we make leadership to be more complicated than it, than it needs to be but it's those three things right and so we say well you need to be a servant leader well that's that part of that is motivation how do you motivate how do you support but it's all about those three things and it's not what leadership is not is doing emails. It's not about a to-do list. It's not about uh, conference calls. It's not about um, being busy. It's about leading meetings. people to get something done. Yeah, it's yeah. not about meetings. And so we confuse that and we think that, well, if I get all my emails answered, then I'm a good leader. You're not. You're a good doer. Uh, but you, you maybe you're a good manager, but you're not a good leader. So I think uh, we confuse 
a lot of things. We, people, people get management titles and they think that they're a leader and they're not. It, it, it takes a special type of skills to be able to motivate a group of people to get difficult things done. So it's, it's very difficult to do, but it's, it's like chess, right? You can learn to play the game in, in, in a day, but mm -hmm. it takes a lifetime to master. I think leadership is a lot like that. Yeah. I just watched a documentary on uh, chess uh, oh. the other day. I used to play it a lot growing up. I haven't, I haven't played it in years, but I, I always wanted to, to know that castle move when you oh, castle yeah, your yeah. king. Yeah. Cause I would, you know, people would do that and I'm like, I don't understand that move. So I watched this documentary. <laughs> I learned how to do it now. Finally, after, you know, 30 years. Of <laughs> I love it. I was like, I Oh, it. that's how you do it. And then I also learned about the pawn, uh, that you can, like if, if you haven't moved your pawn yet and somebody passes your pawn or whatever, you know how the pawn takes them diagonally. Yeah. That you can, there's a move. I can't remember what it's called, but you can take somebody different than the diagonal move. It was, hmm. I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not a, but anyway. I'm, not a, I'm not a chess expert, but I do know it's uh, leadership. Not, leadership is difficult, like like chess is difficult to. No, to absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So let's yeah. talk about your your books. How did you get into authoring, writing books? What uh, one day you just woke up, hey, I'll write a book. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. No, no, <laughs> no, no <laughs> you know it's funny. Um, uh, you know, I, as I mentioned, I did my time in the military, then did 22 years in corporate. I noticed that my businesses always did better than my peers, right? I always, uh, my, my businesses performed very high levels. We met, we met our, our um, always met our targets. We, we grew to record levels and, and a lot of my peers were jealous of that. They were, you know, they were like, oh, they used to call me the golden child. Well, Rennie's the golden child. Everything he touches turns to gold. And I'm like, I am not a freaking golden child. Like I am no expert in any of this stuff. But what a, one of the things I did is I learned about the power of people and how, you know, people properly motivated and properly treated. Uh, number one, treating people with respect is like my number one rule. But you get more out of them. You get more things done. And, and especially when you share what the mission is and you get everybody on board that mission. And so it's like these simple things that I've done that, that got that yielded all these results. And I tried to talk to my peers like, well, this is what I did. It's not that hard, but here's how you can do it. But I think people thought there was some sort of special, something special I was doing. And it's not special yeah. at all. It's very basic. You had this but magic formula. No, I did not. And, uh, but as I, you know, as I'm older now, you know, in my fifties, I'm like, I've got to tell people, I want to teach the next generation about, about, you know, some of these things that I've learned over the years. And so I really felt strongly about writing it down and getting in, in the hands of people. And I wrote my first book, I guess, three year, 2019, three years ago now. Um, okay. and, uh, and it really was just a, a, a really good guide, basic guide for like good leadership principles. It's called I have the watch. And that's, that was the first book I wrote. And, um, okay. and that, uh, that one is, it's got ex extremely, it's extremely popular. It's, um, I, I've sold this book. I've been paying my mortgage with the sales of this book. It's nice. Nuts. So um, it, the book really took off and uh, it's crazy and um, it's been all over the world. It's, uh, you know, uh, I had a call from, you know, just, just different, different calls I've had. One of it was the uh, FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. is that they have a leadership Whoa. training uh, and they, they act and they have a leadership library. And the, the lady called me up and said that she wanted to let me know that my book is in that their leadership library and the FBI. Um, I had the executive officer, the current executive officer on the USS Tennessee call and asked me to use, if I could use, he could use my book to train, uh, his leaders, current leaders on the Tennessee, the boat I served on, you know, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how many years it is. But um, and so how awesome would that off. be if they invited you to come and oh shoot, I would that. love that. I would love to just do one more run on a on a boat. I mean, just to get down there and submerge and and uh, yeah, you don't you don't know how much guys like me miss those days. Uh it was tough, but we we certainly miss those days of being deployed and yeah. and uh, being part of a crew. But yeah, so the first book I wrote and uh, it took off and went crazy. And um, and so, yeah, so I really got the bug. Um, and um, it was so three really, years ago you did this. That was your first, you wrote, I have the watch. Yeah, three years ago. And um, to be honest with you, uh, I had another book in mind and I had hired a, a writing coach to help me through the process. 
And one of the first things he had said to me is like, he said, don't write the big book first, write a smaller book. And I was like, well, I don't understand. I don't have a smaller book in my head. He's like, you've been, you've been writing articles for, for 15 years. Like you have so much content out there. So we took a lot of my content from uh, well, things I've written over the past 10 years and put it into this first book, I Have the Watch. Mm -hmm. But then the second book was the book I really wanted to, to write. And that's that's called All in the Same Boat. And that's that's really my of all the books I've written, this is this is my favorite. It's it's a uh, uh, it's really the book I wanted to tell the story. And in this book is kind of fun because it's um, it's uh, sort of eight major lessons I learned in the military, how, how I learned them in the military. So you're going to have lots and lots of stories from the boat. So if you want to know what it was like to be on board a deployed submarine at sea in the middle of the Cold War, you're going to get those stories. Nice. And then I actually tell the corporate stories, the, the business stories, how I took those ideas. And I and I use them in running successful businesses uh, in corporate and my own manufacturing business that I started six years ago. So this is really the book I wanted to write. And uh, and so this is really um, this this was this was a labor of love. This is the fairly big book. You know, it's what, 300 some odd pages. Yeah. Uh, but it, it was really the book I wanted to tell uh, this and one. Do you was, have these on audio also? Yeah, yeah. So these two are both on audio books. Uh, the, the fourth book I wrote is not, and there's a reason for it, but... Uh, the fourth? But, uh, you skipped one. Oh, sorry, the third. So a third is... Uh, <laughs> yeah, You're working on a fourth, is... apparently. There's a Freudian <laughs> slip, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, so this book, like I said, this was this this is my first book, and it became wildly popular. It's fairly small, easy to read. Uh, mm -hmm. You can read it in probably three hours. But one of the things people who read this book kept saying is like, this is like a daily, some, a daily reader. You could read this every morning and it would give you some clues to become a better leader. And I never really thought of it. I didn't write it that way. But it made, gave me the idea for my, for my latest book that just came out this year. It's called You Have the Watch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and really what that is, is um, it's a guided journal. So it's actually a journal that'll, that, that will take you through 50 leadership themes. It's designed to be on your desk for a year. And so every week you tackle a different different theme. It's like a and calendar. You actually, yeah, yeah, and you read, and and there's a lot of like reflecting and writing. So inside the book, you know, you're you're, you're I don't know how much you can see it, but you you're reading and reflecting. Oh, let me switch my screen. Hold on, I'm I'm sharing okay. my screen. All right, but there we go. But yeah, so you can see you're 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 reflecting on a particular subject, yeah. and then you're uh and you're you're you usually have a task or something. Kind of hyper focused. Day. Yeah, and so it's more of a it's it's more of a, a journal than it is more of a book, but it's designed for for you to be you know to go through it over a entire year. So yeah. it, you know one of the things we see with leadership training is that somebody might go to like like an hour training and then like oh you're now you're a leader or you watch a video or you watch a TED talk or whatever, but it's a one time event or you read a book it's a one time event. This is meant to be a, a year long event, and I think constant. We, yeah, we need something like that. So, so this, reinforcement kind of deal. Yeah, so this book was written basically on the feedback from my customers and my readers from the first book. So these two, these two are kind of related. I have the watch, and you are you have the watch are kind of related. And then all in the same boat is more a standalone book, essentially. Gotcha. Yeah, I like your logo that you got going there. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's on my podcast too. It's this little submarine thing. Yeah, it's the what? What is that part of the submarine called? Yeah, your conning tower. Yeah, the conning tower. Yeah, I thought it was a cross at first. No, nope. looks like one though. Could be. Yeah, it kind of looks like a cross there. So. If it offends you, it is. Yeah. It doesn't <laughs> offend me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's just, that was. I'm sure not you don't have. You know, I'm sure you have people that listen to this are not offended by a cross. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Not at all. Uh, like I said, I mean the the two A community is a welcoming community. All walks of life, religions. Absolutely or non-religion, you know, whatever your choice may be. Um, that's why I try to keep religion and politics. I don't talk a lot of those on the, the show. I, again, I like to keep it positive, you know, because those Absolutely. are two of the biggest, you know, controversial topics that lead to divisiveness and what, yeah, uh, absolutely. chaos. Same thing with our show, too. We're, we really want to talk about leadership and and uh, I don't really care where you came from. You can be a good leader. And and so that's what we focus on, too. Same thing. We don't get into politics too much, although, I you know, I, I did talk to a lot of, um, you know, folks that served in Afghanistan right after the withdrawal and just kind of just not to get political, but I wanted to get their feeling. how they Yeah, felt. that's not really mm -hmm. political. Again, you know, right, when you talk about right. something like that. And, you know, speaking of what what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, you know, <laughs> we were there for a long time. You think we could figure out a plan to exit, you know, and, and, and why didn't we use a major air base? Why did we do what we did? How we came, how we pulled out of there? There's just so many questions that, um, but why do you think they did what they did? Do you think it was just knee jerk, um, bad advice and they're just like, let's just pull it and go and leave everything. And I think that they thought abandon all those people. I think they thought it would go better than it did. I really thought they you really they, you really think they did. It was hope. Hope was their strategy. They they really hoped it would go well, and it was a disaster. And the thing is, what gets me from a leadership standpoint is no one was had no one was held accountable for that. And that's that I struggle with that we mm -hmm. that nobody uh, and it wasn't the 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 soldiers on the ground, the Marines on the ground. Oh no that, no no! It was the people making the decisions, and those people are still in power, and that bothers me. You know, it's the only the, guy that was taken out was that. Uh, the one lieutenant colonel who just said, he said that same thing, Marine Corps lieutenant colonel said, hey, how come no one's being held accountable? And he lost his job based on Yeah, that. they held him accountable. <laughs> yeah. Probably yeah. the only one that was pushing, you know, not to do what they did and they, they get rid of him. Yeah. So I think part of leadership is accountability. When you run a ship aground, when you run a submarine aground, you lose your job as a captain mm -hmm. of a submarine. If it touches anything other than liquid, you lose your job. And, and that's I think the that way it is. And again, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to talk politics, but again, I think that's the problem with uh, our leadership this day is that there's no accountability whatsoever. And we have to be more um, stringent, more, um, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for, to, to, to push accountability on these leaders. Yeah, absolutely. That, that That's very much bothersome. Um, you know, I mean, we we had the border situation where they were talking about the border guards were whipping, you know, the the, the migrants and oh my gosh, you yeah. know, and those guys got put on, they got suspended, the 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 border guards, and they were doing their job, and they and it was just something that was blown out, and even even the way blown out of proportion, yeah, yeah. So, and but again, who was held accountable? Where where was the forgiveness? Where were these guys reinstated uh, with full pay? Uh, no, but and that's that's what's bothersome is that. Um, we throw people under the bus in, in, in too much in politics, uh, and that's poor leadership. If you if you're going to lead a business and you're always constantly throwing your people under the bus, you're you're not a leader. You're you're no. you're weak. And that's the environment doing. that these current um, you, and they're not leaders. You know, our politicians are not leaders. No, they, they don't they don't lead us. They're, and that's a misconception. You know, that's going to get into our talking lead facts to fight the myths. Now. It's time for the talking lead facts to fight the myths. Yeah, <laughs> this is is politicians are not leaders. They are not elected to be leaders. They are elected to um, carry out our our wishes, our demands, the populace, and you know what we see fit and how we would like our country, our states, our counties, our cities run. And I think that's that's where a lot of people and they're afraid to hold these people accountable because they think they are leaders and they think they're going to get some sort of reprimand if they speak up or out against them. You know, that's a dictatorship and we're not in a dictatorship in this country. Not yet anyway, but I think that's, you know, they're they're trying to shape it into that to where you're subservient to these politicians and we're not. Yeah, yeah, they work for us. And I think it's we we sometimes supposed to. They're supposed to. <laughs> so no, that. enough politics. We'll get out of the politics realm. And um, again, go to John's website. It's J-O-N-S-R-E-N-N-I-E.com. And that's where you can check out his books. You can get them uh, audio, obviously, get the audio versions of those too. Uh, and you Freudian slipped. Are you working on a fourth? No. Uh, you are too. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I've got you a lot are. of different ideas. Um, but uh, I think probably I'll write a little bit about what it's like to start a business, uh, being a leader in a, in, in a startup company. Uh -huh. uh, there's there's something to be said there. Uh, there's a whole another leadership um, skill set to lead a business from the ground up, uh, sure. which I've been doing for six years. So there's something to be said there. There may be a book there. So, but I told my wife, I said, well, it has to be it has to have a good ending. Otherwise, you can't write a book on it, right? So, <laughs> so we're know, still building our business. So. <laughs> some books that don't have good endings, but. <laughs> right, that's right. So on our facts to fight the myth, you know, we talked about this prior to, do you have a, a fact to fight the myth maybe that's related to 
the the submarine life, the corporate life, maybe well, can some think, carry hunting. What what is it? What do you got? One one of the things I noticed, like coming into the civilian world as being former military, is that there everyone sort of the myth of a submarine, or sorry, the myth of a military leader is that they're all command and control. That that I'm going to come in, and I'm going to dictate how things are going to be done. And uh, the facts are, especially on, uh, on a submarine, is that there is no real hierarchy on a submarine. Yes, we had ranks, but we all lived in the same metal tube. We we ate the same food. We um, we slept in the same size racks. We had there was no special benefit. Smelled the same stinky air. Absolutely, you know when 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 the um, you know, when we couldn't make fresh water, we didn't have showers. When we didn't have, when the galley was secured for maintenance or drills, we ate, we all ate cold cuts. Uh, so we suffered together. We, uh, and so there's less of the separation between officers and enlisted in, in, the, in the submarine community more than anything. And so we, we were, we were used to operating uh, together, you know, in tight spaces, uh, working as a team to get things done. So uh, yeah, command and control was a lot is not what I'm about. It's about working with people to get things done. So I think that was a big myth. I I never even thought about it. When, but when I came into an organization, I saw his former military. They're like, oh, great. Here, here comes this guy. You know, right. here comes the whips and chains. What to do. Yeah, but it's not true at all. So in fact, even if you think about it, uh, you know, Simon Sinek wrote the book, Leaders Eat Last. Well, that's something the military leaders have always done, that they put their people in, fr in, front, of, in front of themselves. Uh, it happens in the Marine Corps. It happens in the Army. It helps, happens across in all military branches. So, yeah, so th there's a myth that uh, military leaders are a certain way, but it's completely false. Yeah, I like that. That's a good one. Yeah. So I got a, I got another question about submarine. Um, yeah. And then, and then I want to go to our listener questions. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll fill some of those. Um, what is the, I guess, the scariest or most disturbing time that you had while you're on the submarine? Hmm. So my, I wrote about it in, uh, in my all on the same boat. It's chapter eight. Um, it's, uh, it was, it's the chapter eight is called tough times. Uh, and, um, I was in, uh, I was in the North Atlantic for a, a winter storm that lasted nearly two weeks. Uh, and it was brutal. It was my first patrol, my first deployment, uh, first time being away from home, and uh, we were taking rolls, uh, close to 45 degree rolls each way, uh, submerged below the surface of the of the ocean. Oh wow! Uh, it was it was dreadful. Like, yeah, it was it was dreadful. I remember thinking, "There's just no way I can make a career out of this. This this is awful." But even the most senior um, sailors were 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 seasick. It was. It was miserable uh, for, like I said, for almost two weeks uh, oh, in wow. the North Atlantic, and um, so yeah, it um, you know the the we would um, when we come to periscope depth, the, uh, the 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 back of a submarine of, of a Trident submarine or an Ohio class is flat, and so you get the surface effect where where the waves will will pull the boat, and so what's called broaching. Broaching uh -huh. means the whole boat comes out of the water. Uh, and there was so much wave action that we kept broaching the, the 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 boat, and the propeller was coming out of the water, and the and it was it, it was it was a it was a it was scary for me. And it's funny because our captain didn't seem bothered at all. I mean, he just wasn't his first rodeo, probably. Huh? No, it wasn't his first rodeo. It was my first rodeo. It was yours. <laughs> so, so you I mean, thought it was the end of times at, at, during that storm. Oh, we would sit down to have a meal, and our and you know the. the the plates, everything was just going down, up and down the table, and just it was just brutal. It was brutal. Well, that's a so. question too: is how do you, how do the plates stay on the tail? Is there some sort of a special plate that you guys have, or something no. you attach them, like you Velcro? Hold, you hold on to it. <laughs> you just hold on to it and hope you don't spill it, huh? Yeah. So we did have a place for our coffee cups, uh, and that's kind of a funny thing. Uh, submarines they have these. Almost like cup holders all over the submarine. They're called zarfs, and that's the name. That's Zarf. what they're called, and okay. that's just what we called them. That's where you put your coffee cup in. So. Do you know where that term came from? I don't know. It probably has some interesting origin story, but uh, there was a lot that's of weird little that. names. Uh, like anytime you find a little hole where you you'd like they could store stuff or put stuff, that was called a puka, and okay. I think that's actually a Hawaiian term. But uh, but I don't know where zarf came from at all. But uh, we had a lot of weird, um, yeah, names for things. Yeah, exactly. 
Got you. All right, let's go to uh, some listener questions here. Okay. And while while I'm looking these up, is there is there something that maybe we were talking about that you wanted to uh, expand upon? Uh, We've talked about a lot. I know. Yeah, yeah, we talked about a lot, but um, um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's just I would say this is that being on a submarine is a lot like being on a spaceship. You know, uh, you know, like the guys that go out in the the space station, they live mm -hmm. for six months. It's it's very similar to that because what's outside the hull can kill you. What's outside the spacecraft can kill you, right? So your your enemy is two things. One is, for us, it was the Soviet Union, but it was also uh, the, the, the crushing uh, pressure of the seawater that wanted to get inside the people tank, right? So so yeah. we had a common enemy uh, on the uh, uh, inside that boat was to keep the seawater out of the boat. Did you ever have any enemy encounters? Yeah, so in my in the beginning when the Soviets were very active, yeah, we would have a lot of uh, mostly surface ships would be sort of harassing us, trying to get uh, photos of us and trying to listen to our engines and things like that. Yeah, yeah. but no like depth charges or anything like that. You never had like no. an attack on you? No, 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 no. It was uh, it was a cold war for a reason. It wasn't a hot war, so we didn't. Uh, we did. Did you ever get to uh, fire the torpedoes? Yes, fire torpedoes a lot. We used to go down every uh, every other patrol. We'd go down to uh, the Caribbean, down to Autech uh, testing range, and we fire torpedoes. And then I fired four missiles as well too. I got a chance to ah. fire four Trident missiles uh, during different testing that we did. So, uh, but yeah, I got a chance to but fire. Just, four. Do you have like targets on a land somewhere that you or you got boats uh, out on of the, the other side of the Atlantic Ocean? Yes. On the other side, of the, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. obviously, yeah. Let's see. I'm um, going to Instagram here, and I'll take the first one here. Arms of Cascadia. How do you deal with the lack of daylight while underwater? I imagine it messes with sailors' circadian rhythm. Pretty yeah, bad. yeah. So it does. It really does mess with you. Um, like I said, not knowing night and day was. It, you sort of got used to it after a while, but it's certainly, um, yeah, you didn't know if you were coming or going, if you didn't know, you know until you, unless you went to periscope depth and looked through the periscope, you wouldn't know if it was daylight or night. So yeah, that did mess with us. So, you know, what do they call that? That sad, you know, seasonal affective disorder. People get that in the winter time when they don't get sunlight. I think. Yeah. Had, you get depressed. I think and... we had that uh, on the submarine, to be honest, because we did I not. I can imagine. Get yeah. Yeah. We're, we're pretty pale dudes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you answered most of this one. Brett Bedal says, what was your role? And we talked about that. Yeah. Also talk about the weirdest systems malfunction you had to deal with underway or underwater. Well, you know, I was the, I was the machinery division officer for a while. And uh, that meant I had the two evaporator units. That's where we made our fresh water. And so they were notorious uh, for going down. They, they were very difficult um, pieces of equipment to keep maintained. And so, um, so it's kind of funny uh, because whenever we lose fresh water, the first thing we do is secure the showers. But I, after a while, I got a little bit, I figured this out. So what I would do is whenever they go down, I'd go take a shower myself I, before I told the captain, go take a nice hot shower. And then I would get my uniform back on and I go tell the captain. I said, well, captain, both of the uh, rapiders are down. Uh, we have to secure showers. He's like, all right, so let's secure the showers. But I always got my shower in first. Before I did that. <laughs> Is it just one minute? Well, I got something no, to yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a good one here. Um, I just lost it. Oh no. Here we go. Bailey Muller eighty on a screen. What do you see as the next innovation in submarine warfare or technology? Well, I think I think the question uh, a couple of things. One is uh, how do you how do we how do we resupply um, submarines at sea with with using potentially using drones and, and how, how can we use drones both uh, in, in the air and also underwater to support the mission? So how do we yeah. use underwater drones and uh, uh, flying drones to support the missions that we have? So can you imagine if you went to periscope depth and you also launched a 
uh, an aerial drone, which could see, you know, long distance yeah. uh, to see what was going on out there uh, that would interface with the submarine and you get a better, you know, eye in the sky, essentially, uh, for yeah. what's going on. So, yeah, I can see the use of um, unmanned drones, both underwater and in the air to support um, submarine operations. Yeah, I can't imagine they're not doing that. Yeah, maybe they do already. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, 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 would, I mean, I would just, that would be just like one of those, duh, like, of course yeah. they are. If they aren't, then. <laughs> um, what sorts of firearms are kept on a submarine? So that's kind of an interesting question. So um, we, uh, we had 1911s for handguns. So uh, we had, um, we had shotguns, pump shotguns. Uh, and then we had, uh, uh uh m14s we had m14 okay. rifles so we had only three types of weapons now now i know they've got m60s that they mount on the sail for when you're in port and what have you but that's back in the day we had m14s shotguns and uh and 45s that's all we and i carry i used to have to carry a 45 whenever we were doing any work with the weapons so when we were in port and we were doing warhead changes and stuff i carried a 45 uh, during that time, because there are certain points where deadly force was authorized if you got beyond certain areas. So we had to defend that. So, yeah. And were there any instances on any of your deployments um, to where crew wise you had to break out a firearm? Yeah, I tell a story in the book where. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, the, the the base duty officer failed to inform me. I was a ship's duty officer at night. They were doing a um, a mock battle on uh, uh, on on one of the um, buildings on the waterfront. Uh, so they had Marines doing a fake uh, invasion, if you will, or protection uh, operation. And um, so I was the ship's duty officer, and then uh, I hear. Uh, my uh, topside watch calls over the one MC, which is the announcement in the whole boat saying, um, uh, you know, repel borders, which means we've got people trying to break in. Uh, and I hear, I hear automatic gunfire uh, coming over the one MC. And so we, at that point, locked and loaded, prepared to, we, we Pucker secured factor the, went up. <laughs> yeah, we secured the ship. And I, I was like, this is not a drill because I mean, I was not informed of anything happening on base. And uh, I got on the um, got on the periscope and look. I could see, you know, troops running towards the uh, the uh, covered dry dock area. And um, I didn't really know what was going on until until I noticed. Uh, I had trained with the Marines, and so uh, I happened to catch that the all the M16s they were carrying had the uh, blank fire adapter on the end of it. And as soon yeah. as I saw that, I knew it was a drill and that they were doing something. But it wasn't. So we secured quickly from the drill. But we had locked and loaded. We were ready to defend the boat. We didn't know what was going on. But uh, yeah, that, so that was a miscommunication. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I tell the story in the book. I, I called up was Lieutenant Commander, which he outranked me on the base duty officer, and I chewed him out. And then I broke the secured phone, the Stu three phone. I I smashed it into a lot of pieces because I was really pissed off that um, yeah we had loaded weapons uh, and yeah. We were ready Luckily, to the use captain, them. The captain yeah. backed me up, so. I did the right thing. What kind of a checkoff process do you do? You guys have as a, um, as are you, what do you call? Are you called submariners or what? Submariners. Yeah. Submariners. submariners. Yep. Yep. Submariners. Um, is there like a, a, a weekly, monthly kind of firearms refreshing course for you know that you have to get we, checked out on the weapons or? We would every off crew we would go shoot. So um, so we would shoot all the, the the weapons we would use the the we were all qualified on the shotgun the M, uh, m14 and the 1911 yeah what shotgun so I, were you using uh i can't remember if it was a remington or a mossberg now i think it was i think it might have been the remington i have a mossberg now but i think we were using the remington yeah what is and that the, the what is it the uh seven eight what am i saying i'm forgetting 780 is it is that right or 870 remington 870 the remington yeah. 870 yeah 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 um, and that's something we haven't talked about is, uh, you know, we bring up the shotguns, is that you're an avid bird hunter. Yeah. And uh, let's, I got a question here. That was the one I was uh, leading to a second ago. I said, what is the best bird to hunt if you don't have a bird dog? That's old weird guy asked that. Uh, dove. Because dove, dove is, dove is, they fly towards you. So it's a, it's the 
I mean, it's the laziest way to hunt. I think it's the funnest. I, I didn't. Grow, I didn't grow up dove hunting, but when I moved to the south, they they they, they killed doves. Here. One of the tastiest birds too, bacon wrapped dove. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Dove the dove breast uh, wrapped in uh, bacon with some jalapeno. It's delicious, mm, but it's sure. a blast. I mean, it's so much fun to. Uh, you basically, you know, for those who don't know, have never done it before, you basically sit on a five gallon bucket in the field. And the birds come to you and you stand up and you shoot them and they land typically right at your feet. So yeah. you don't really need a dog. I mean, sometimes they'll get lost in the in the brush, but uh, you really don't need a dog. So I would say dove probably the best. What's your favorite bird hunt? Well, I, I grew up uh, uh, hunting rough grouse in, in New England. So grouse is absolutely my favorite. We hunt grouse and woodcock. And they're just such a challenge because we spend a lot of time. We'll spend, we'll be in the field maybe hiking eight to 10 miles in a day up the side of mountains and what have you look, you know, you know, trying to find these birds and where their habitat is. So it's, it's very challenging. Um, you, you, when you shoot, it's what we call snap shooting. So it doesn't matter how good you are, you know, um, you know, with sporting clays, you, you, you don't have, you have to react to these birds a lot quicker so fast. Yeah. So it's, we, it's snap shooting. It's, it's a blast. Uh, it's, um, it's so much challenge. It's so difficult. Um, you know, I'll, you know, I think about it sometimes, you know, I, I used to deer hunt. I don't do it anymore, but you know, deer hunting, you might set up and, you know, you spend your whole season getting your rifle ready and prepping your gear and all that. And you may take one shot in a season, whereas bird hunting, you're taking, you might take a box, you know, you might shoot oh, a box yeah. in a day. So to me, that's more fun. You get a lot yeah. more things to do, a lot more shooting, a lot more of a challenge. Um, do you use a different shotgun for different birds? Yeah, I do. Yeah. But I, but I have a favorite, I have an over and under uh Ruger red label that is just my, it's my baby. Um, I just absolutely love that gun. Uh, it's got shorter barrels because of the, 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 um, where we hunt in, in the brush and what have you. So you want to be a little bit lighter, a little bit shorter. So absolutely love that gun. So they don't make them anymore, unfortunately, but what it's, is it called? Uh, red a Ruger, what? It's a Ruger red label. I'm looking yeah, it up now. Over, yeah. It's an over and under. Uh, and I could change out the chokes. And so just, just a great field gun. I'm pulling it up now. I think I found it here. Let's see. Is that it? Yeah, that's my baby. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in the field with, with, with that one. So it's, a, it's just a great gun. So and just, Solid. I, I'm a, I'm a Ruger fan. You know, there, you know, when growing up, there used to be a lot of Ruger uh, factories in New England. There still are. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, yeah, I just always, I, I have a lot of Rugers. I like Ruger as a brand. I've always thought of it as sort of like the Toyota. It's maybe a little bit cheaper, but you still get good quality. Uh, maybe, I don't know. That's, that's my view of the world. I'm not a, sure. I'm, I'm not a pure gun guy. Like probably some check people, out. Are, some people check are out. Uh, listening to me and yelling at the screen right now. I'm sure. <laughs> check out Nemo arms. Okay. Okay. Uh, and their their shotguns. You they're they're not cheap, <laughs> but they're okay. really nice shot. I think you'll like their their over and unders. Uh, really, their heirloom quality. Oh yeah. Type firearms. They're they're really so, nice. One of the things that we got to be careful with, like the kind of hunting we do, is because we're in the deep woods and we're going through swamps and trees, is that our our weapons get beat up pretty good. So we sure. we um. It, we're, we're always finding the balance between like a good, solid, dependable firearm and also one that yeah. you don't mind getting beat up in the field. Well, <laughs> and when I say heirloom quality, I mean, it's going to last. It's a durable, solid, yeah. but they're, Is you it? know, they're a work of art though. Yeah. They're beautiful. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, we, yeah. We, and they're not a sponsor either. So, I mean, I just... I'll I'll check it out. I I, I the problem is I'll I'll fall in love with them. I, I it's so you easy will. to fall in love with. You're going to cuss me. <laughs> you're going to you're definitely going to cuss me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So when does hunt, hunting season start where you're at? For, for uh, it'd be October. So I'm heading up, I think, the second week in October uh, to to go up uh, for the week that we've got uh, reserved. So okay. and we're, we hunt the same land I've been hunting since I was 13 years old. So it's kind of fun to get up there with yeah. friends and family. The family land? No, no, no. It's um, it's it's owned by uh, paper mills and the state. There's some sort of a joint uh, okay. arrangement there, but it's uh. The, the northern part of New Hampshire is pretty remote. So uh, it's in, it's, you know, you, you could drive, you can drive for hours on dirt roads up there and it's, it's great. Let's see if we've got anything on Facebook uh, real quick here. Do you do turkey hunting? 
No, I've never done turkey hunting. Although oh. um, I know my brother is uh, my brother is a wildlife. Um, well, he's a wildlife biologist, but he's also a hunting and fishing guide for New Hampshire and Maine, and he does turkey hunts, black bear, uh, grouse, woodcock, deer, moose. But um, yeah, he's a big turkey hunter. So one of these days, I got to get up there and do a turkey season. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see. There's one question here, Brett Bedell on Facebook. What's the most challenging spot you found yourself in as a leader while serving? How did you turn the situation around and keep your people focused? Yeah, I mean, um, I tell a story in all in the same boat about um, we had a, a device inside the reactor that failed um, that um, had to be replaced. And uh, it was it felt within my responsibility to develop the maintenance procedure to go in and actually take that piece of equipment out and replace it with a new piece of equipment. Of course, we did it when the reactor was shut down and we were in port. But um, just to develop the procedure uh, took me months to develop and write the procedure. And, and because, because everything had to be choreographed, because you had to limit the amount of time that people were going to be inside the, uh, the reactor compartment doing this work, because it was actually right on top of the reactor itself. So we had to have uh, teams go in, and there were a limited certain amount of time they could be in there. So everything had to be staged and choreographed. All the tools had to be checked in, checked out. And it was one of the most complicated things I'd ever done in my life. And um, and I was young. I was still a new leader uh, on the boat. But after that event, I, I think I solidified my role as the leader of that department. They saw the amount of work I put in and the fact that uh, we did it safely, we did it correctly. And it was the first time that that that, that part had ever been replaced uh, on a Ohio class submarine. So we had to develop the whole procedure and how to do it. So yeah, it, it solidified cool. my role as the leader of that department after that. Yeah. Corey Brown asked, do you know the story about a sub taking out a train? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love, if you want to have some I've fun, read, that. read some of the stories of the World War II submarine crews and the officers and men. They did some amazing things. That was the USS Barb. And uh, they they went and uh, took out a train. Uh, they went on land. I think they took out the bridge that the train was going across and uh, took out the train. So they actually painted a train on there. So you have these uh, war flags that you that you, each ship, and they're sort of like these homemade flags of all the all the shipping that they sink. And they actually had a train on their uh, on their battle <laughs> on their battle uh, flag, which is pretty wild. Yeah, that'd be unique, I bet too. Yeah, yeah, they went on land. Summary. They, they actually went on land and, and sabotaged this uh, train track. Yeah. Cool. Uh, he also asked, which sub movie is your favorite? I, I'm an old uh, uh, traditionalist. I, I hunt for Red October. It can't be beat. You know, you, it just, you know. I, yeah, I can I, watch I, that over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a classic movie. You know, it's a classic uh, Cold War submarine movie, you know. Not very realistic, but it's a great story. So, yeah. So uh, when we were talking uh, yesterday, you were talking about that you are um, a concealed carry yes. person. Um, what is your preferred carry? Yeah, it's, I'm afraid to say this because this but is- But nobody will like judge you, I promise. <laughs> Nobody's going to judge you. You will not be judged, maybe a little bit, but- I have, I have, uh, I carry, I have two cars. Uh, it's KAHR, car firearms yeah, that are out of Worcester, Mass. Them. And um, I have a 380 and a nine millimeter version. I have my summer carry, my winter carry. Uh, so yeah, I like it. It's a little gun. Um, what I like about it is it's it's a stable platform. It, it's when I shoot it. Some of the smaller guns will will snap when you shoot, and so you like a little snappy. You, yeah, yeah, you feel it on your wrists. Well, the the car is pretty solid. It shoots like a bigger frame gun, and um, and I just I just enjoy it. I I really like the nine millimeter. I got the three. I got the 380 just because. It's a little smaller and uh, it's easier to conceal, but um, yeah, it's I, it looks a little bit like a Glock, I guess. But um, yeah, so yeah. I I enjoy it. We, we you know my son, my oldest son was getting his concealed carry and he was looking at guns and he eventually got a got a Car Nine. He really likes the way it shoots and I've never had any jams, any problems with it. It's just it's been reliable for me. So you know, and that's what I tell people too. You know, I always. People always come up to me and say, hey, which which firearm should I get? I'm considering, you know, a carrier or whatever. And you know, I liken it to like a pair of shoes. Yeah. So yeah. everybody's got a different size foot and different yeah. different shoes fit people differently. It's like I can't wear Nikes. Nikes just yeah. don't fit my foot at all. And I don't I don't like Nikes. But you know, they're 
you know, Michael Jordan and people that just, you know, absolutely swear by Nike. But uh, it, go to the gun range. A lot of these places have rental programs where you can rent the guns. You can try them out uh, before you buy them and just see what feels better in your hand. And, mm. you know, that that's the best way that the best advice that I can give people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other thing, too, is, you you know, your concealed carry is going to get beat up a little bit. You know, you're getting in and out of cars. You're, you know, you're it's going to get scratched. It's going to get have I mean, sweat on them. You're going to get yeah, holster so, marks on them. Yeah. Again, I'm looking for reliability, but I don't want to spend a lot of money either. So that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> so you're frugal, I, I take it. Uh, well, I want to, I want bang for the buck. I want good, you know, so I did a lot of research before I bought the car and I really, I really liked it once I got it. So that's, that's why yeah. I went and got the 380 version of it. Cause I just loved it. So the nine. So, so even being trained in the military on, uh, I would assume you had a SIG. I don't know. What did you have? What was your 1911? What was your 1911? It was Colt 1911. Was it Colt 1911? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way I trained on. I, I, yeah, I never had anything but a 45 uh, in in my time in the military. So yeah, that, I'm old school, I guess. Did you I, get to take your service pistol with you or buy no, or get the option no. to purchase it? No, in fact, I, I I want I still want to add a 1911 to my uh, to my you know your my arsenal, armory, yeah. my arsenal. But I want I want to get one that was just like what I had. I want the government yeah. uh, model version of it because it's just something I have. They're out there. They're available. Yeah, exactly. So I'm looking for one that. Uh, I can afford, you know me, I'm cheap. You can afford, <laughs> you can afford anything you want. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. So, um, conceal carry, uh, you're a hunter. Um, was there anything else about the hunting, the bird hunting that you wanted to convey to our, our I know turkey hunting is coming up here yep. Um, yep. Close in Tennessee and uh, probably around the, the country, but uh I think you should do that. I think you should go on a turkey hunt. It's completely different than any of the other bird hunts that you've, that you've been on. Yeah, yeah. No, I'd, I'd like I'd like to. Uh, you know, it's funny because and you don't need a dog for turkey hunting either. No, no, no. You don't at all. Yeah, no. I'm, I I just haven't had the opportunity. I just didn't. Um, for whatever reason, when, when my brother was getting big in the turkey hunting, I was I was still in the military, and we yeah. he's still back in New England. We just didn't I didn't connect. I didn't have anybody that that wanted. If if, if anyone said Do you want to go turkey hunting, I'd say yes. It just it just hadn't come up. So yeah, you haven't uh, haven't been offered the opportunity, huh? Yeah, you yeah. Come so down to Tennessee, and we'll go turkey hunting. <laughs> All right, that sounds good. Um, but uh, no, I mean, think I think. Um, you know, grouse hunting is sort of like an old, you know, New England thing, you know, and I guess it's kind of fun to do, you know, I think they do it in Michigan as well. And it's, but it's, it's typically in the Northern climates and it's just a, uh, dog, no dogs required for that. No, we bring dogs. Yeah. We bring a dog. Yeah. We have two dogs. Um, we have a German short hair pointer and we have a lab that, uh, so you have a flusher and, you, and a pointer that work together. Sometimes they work together. If things are working well, they work together. <laughs> Yeah. So let's let's uh, reward our listeners, John. Uh, we mm. like to reward those that participate. And I again, I apologize, Leadheads. It was a late post uh, for your questions. If you didn't didn't get an opportunity, uh, just keep a lookout. Uh, we're always posting questions for our guests. Uh, that's how you participate. That's how we uh, reward you. If you're sending us Jack Wagon nominations, Leadhead Brigade <laughs> Hero nominations. Uh, if you're uh, leaving comments on the, the podcast, you know, we go everywhere. We look, we try to reward you for doing uh, awesome stuff to help support the show. And today, John has offered up one each of his books to you listeners. And John, do you want to give those all three to one or do you want to spread the love and give three different uh, listeners your books? Well, let's, let's spread the love. Why not? I like that. I yeah. definitely like that. So of the questions that I read, what was your favorite? Which one was your favorite? Uh, let's see. Um, well, let's see. The, what was, let's see. The first, the beginning, what was the one question? Oh, let's see. The one with the the, su the submarine movie, favorite submarine movie. Okay. I think it was the same one. It was the equipment. Uh, it was the same Corey one. Corey Brown asked, uh, what was the, oh, this, he asked several. 
Yeah. The one I read was, do you know the story about the sub taking out a train? Oh, right. That's the one. Yeah. That he knew that your favorite sub the barb. So we'll, we'll, that's, that's definitely a winner right there. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Corey Brown, you have won. Which book did, are you, we going to? We're going to go all on the same boat. That's the, that's the biggie. Ah, nice. All yeah. in the same boat for Corey Brown. So Corey, email me talking at gmail.com and I will forward your info on to John uh, for the book. Yeah, I'm trying to think what the first question was. That was a good one. The very first one was the arms of Cascadia. How do you deal with the lack of daylight while underwater? With with circadian rhythm? What is it? (laughs) Circadian rhythm. Circadian or circadian. I don't know if he spelled it right or not. Well, that wins the book just for for that word. For that word, whether he got it right or not. So we'll (laughs) go with uh, I have the watch. I have the watch. So Arms of Cascadia, email me. Let me know which book that you uh, that you won, and uh, I'll forward your info. Of course, we need your, your mailing address as well. Uh, and then book three, who do we want to – are you on uh, social media right now? Are you on Instagram? Can you pull Instagram up? Yeah. Pull it up and then go to that post that I did, and I'll just let you – and while you're doing that, here's here's one that requires no answer, okay? Okay. Slug Nutty. Is it Slug. true that in the submarine service that 120 men go down and 60 couples come up? Slug Nutty gets no book for no. that comment. <laughs> but he needs to know that it's it, there's an expression in the Navy, it's not gay if it's underway. So just understand that. <laughs> <laughs> And my, my son, my son who was in the Navy, he also said it's not queer if you're by the pier, too. So I don't know what that means. But, uh, uh, yeah, so. Um, Just another disassociative term, I guess. But absolutely. Uh, Slug Nutty wins the Smart Ass Award for this. He gets uh, the Smart Ass yeah. Award, yeah. I didn't, I didn't respond to that when I saw that. But, uh, I didn't well, either. I, I thought the old weird guy had a good question about the birth, best birds to hunt if you don't have a bird dog. There you go. Old yeah, weird guy. That was good. That's yeah. a good that's a good. So which one did does he win? Well, we'll give him uh, you have the watch. Well, you know what? Let's give him I have the watch because he's probably old. I he's have the here. watch. There you go. So old weird guy, I have the watch. Email me, talking at gmail.com. You know the, the routine. Uh, so I, I think that's uh, most of the question. I know you posted some, reposted it. Did you get any questions on your, your post that not. you did? No, no. Oh, come on. I don't think so. Come on, followers of John. <laughs> Questions, participate. That's how you went on the show. You listen, you participate, you win. Uh, I've got a packet of Seal One uh, that I would like to award to one of our listeners. So, and it's not going to be anybody that posted a question. I am actually going to go to. Uh, our Instagram page, and if you have tagged me or reshared one of my posts, and I got to go, there's a way to do this on Instagram, so just bear with me. I got to go here. I hit that, and there's a little thing. Where's that icon at that I can see where you've posted me? I suck at social media. (laughs) I really do. Just bear with me. (laughs) I'm going to find it. Oh, here it is. Okay, boom. So. Here we go. PNW Chupacabra. Chubra. Chupacra. C H U P A C A V R A. Tag me in a post. Um, so ch- if you're an American, <laughs> if you live in America, <laughs> email me talkinglet at gmail.com. You won. Some seal one. There's the post he did. I don't know if you can see that or not. Oh yeah, yeah. So we do this this um, this other show is called the Talking Lead AK Corner, John, and we just talk AK 47s on this this episode. And 
uh, we get a lot of listeners that are really into the AK-47. So PNW, you win some SEAL 1. Email me, talking at gmail.com. And as a reminder, any unclaimed prizes, we send to Sheepdog IA, Sheepdog Impact Assistance. That's an organization, John, that uh, helps our veteran wounded men and women of the military, law enforcement, first responders, uh, by doing all sorts of things. They have outdoor adventures. They have uh, fundraising events. They have hunts. They have all kinds of cool things that they do to help keep our men and women off the couch and keep them active uh, to help cut down on the suicide rate. Because we know that, as you, as you just said, when they retire, they still have that desire to to serve, to do something. They put together disaster recovery missions. So when there's flooded areas or there's disaster by mother nature, tornadoes, hurricanes, whatever it may be, they'll put together disaster recovery teams to go out and help, uh, whether it's cutting down trees or putting down sandbags or providing food or uh, whatever's needed. Um, Sheepdog Impact Assistance. You got to check, check them out, sheepdogia.org, and go donate. Donate your time, donate your money, donate your resources. Um, they, they definitely need your, your help. Sergeant Major Lance Nutt, we've had him on the show several times. So any unclaimed prizes, we automatically donate those to, to Sheepdog Impact Assistance. Great. Um, but great show, man. I appreciate you, John, taking the time to be on. I know it's probably not your normal interview. But, <laughs> no, not uh, at all, but I loved it. I, I was just intimidated with all these, you know, with the firearm questions. I don't want to say something that's not. Yeah, uh, expecting a show called Talking Lead, and it's <laughs> Talking Lead. It wasn't Talking Lead. It was Talking Lead. When, and when did you have that epiphany that it wasn't Talking Lead? When when, <laughs> when we talked yesterday, <laughs> I had no, like, no idea. I So I do so many podcasts that I didn't, I, you know, I didn't. I, I see lead in the title of most podcasts I'm on. So I just saw lead and I'm. Oh, yeah. Really, I get that all the time, too. Uh, I've got my truck wrapped with our, our logo and, you know, I've got my shirts and everything. People come up to me and go, what's talking lead? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I was like, well, we're a dog training service. And <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you couldn't tell with the bullets and all our sponsors that are on the, the vehicle. And it's like. Yeah, here's your sign. I, I get it now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad it worked out, though. And uh, I, again, I do really appreciate you taking the time to be on. I, I, you know, this has been one of my favorite interviews that I've done. We've never had uh, a submariner, submariner uh, on the show before. So it's very interesting. Yeah, we're, we're, we're one of the branches of the military that's kind of small and not a lot of people who, you know, have served on submarines. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we're a little bit of a rare bird. So, yeah, it's fun, fun. To, it's fun to talk about it because it was such a big part of my life. And it's something I just, you know, dreamed as a youth to, 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 to want to do and I get a chance to do that. And, um, you know, ser serve our country during a whole different time. You know, people don't, don't, the probably don't realize what, what the Cold War was like, but, um, but, you know, with Reagan coming into office and, you know, building up the Navy and, you know, winning the Cold War, you know, it was fun to be a part of that and uh, to kind of write that chapter, be a part of that chapter, be part of history. And, uh, yeah, it's a good launching yeah. point for our career, for sure. Absolutely. And uh, one more time, give everybody where they can go, uh, your website, your social meds. Yeah. I want you, Leadheads, to go and follow John and let him know that you're a uh, Leadhead Brigade and you appreciate him being on the show, even though he thought it was a, a leadership show. <laughs> <laughs> now, every you know my website is johnsrenny.com and um you can spell john any way you want it'll get there but um all my social media links are out there i'm very active on twitter very active on instagram uh i run a podcast called deep leadership it's on every podcast uh, station we interview uh, military leaders business leaders entrepreneurs um, authors researchers so it's all about leadership so if you're listening in you're like leading a company or your work you work in management and you're uh, in, we're at work. This is a good place to go and learn some skills, get better, uh, to manage your career better, to, to be able to get the best results from your team. And um, yeah, it's all about, for me, it's all about building a world with better bosses. That's what I write my books for. That's why I do my podcast. It's all about trying to make better bosses in the next generation. See if we can do a little bit better than we did this one. So 
<laughs> well, you just you just did a great job leading uh, on this podcast. So thank you again for your time. Let heads again go show him some love. Show all our sponsors love. Mission First Tactical. Go to missionfirsttactical.com. Use the code Leadhead. You're going to get 25 or 20 percent off. Uh, I'd like to give you an additional 5%. Maybe we can talk Dave into that. Uh, but uh, go check them out. Mission First Tactical. Seal1.com uh, for all your gun cleaning, lubrication, and corrosive protection. It works on anything. It'll work great on your shotgun too, John. So mm. I'll uh, I'll have some sent to you. I'll send you some oh, Seal1. Look at that. Um, we'll send you some Mission First stuff too. Um, Seal1.com. Use the code LEADHEAD. You're going to get 25% off there. 1776 United. You like the t-shirt that i'm wearing you get our, our talking lead talking lead if you if you're so inclined uh t-shirts uh you go to 1776 united um if you've seen some of my posts i've worn some of their other shirts you can anything there talking lead is the code 20 percent off uh, i was talking about our flashlights earlier from asp usa and i don't have them handy now here's one right here uh, they got cool Awesome flashlights. They do all kinds of different trickeries, uh, but great flashlights. Uh, ASP USA, use the code all caps, leadhead to get 15% off. Factory 47 for our AK corner t-shirts uh, and sweaters and sweatshirts and all the cool stuff that they have there. And then IWI US, thank them. Let them know that your leadheads don't have a discount code for you there yet. You can go to Keltec and get a nice discount in their pro shop. Use the code LEADHEAD, 15% off at Caltech. Anything but their firearms, you're going to get a discount there. And I'm forgetting somebody, but go show all our sponsors and friends of the show some love and uh, let them know you're LEADHEAD. I'm sure if they don't have a discount code, we can get one set up for you. Just ask. All right, LEADHEADS, that does it for another episode of the Talking Lead Podcast. Appreciate each and every one of you tuning in every week and supporting the show and supporting our sponsors. And until then, as always, keep your loved ones close. And keep your firearms closer. And remember, you have the watch. <laughs>